I'm Abby Wozniak, and I'm the new director of the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute here at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. This is my first conference that we're hosting during my tenure as director, and what a conference to start with. Um, we're pulling together a lot of research and the Fed mission in a really important way over these next two days. So we're here today and tomorrow to consider the question, what does the Fed need to know about how different households fare over the business cycle and under alternative monetary policy actions? Scholars who are working at the frontier of research into distributional differences in the US have considered this question in their work. But the decision to invite them here to discuss this work in our conference setting was prompted in part by the Fed's own planned review of its monetary policy options and the way it communicates those options and decisions to the public. This review is going to be unfolding over the remainder of 2019. We are very excited to have a number of leaders in this review joining us at the conference. I'm just going to point out a few of them. Um, first, we have Board of Governors Vice Chair Richard Clarida, and we have our own uh, Minneapolis Fed President, Neil Kashkari, as well as our Research Director, Mark Wright, from here in Minneapolis. So these folks and others are going to help incorporate what we hear today and tomorrow into conversations going forward as part of this review. To contribute answers on this big question, we have a tremendous lineup of panelists. Also, and importantly, I want you to understand that our panels are going to come in three flavors. So we're starting off with a research panel um, in which we've invited researchers to present pieces of their work that provide key insights into the conference's organizing question. We're going to then take a break and follow this up with a set of policy panelists who will offer a somewhat broader approach to our question and who will also reflect a bit on what was presented in the research panel. And we're going to repeat that um, order tomorrow. And then we'll close tomorrow with a lunch over which we'll have a set of distinguished community members. Um, and I know we have a couple of folks in the community panel visiting here. I wanted to kind of just highlight them as well. If you would put up your hand, we have Gloria. Um, and we have Myron as well, um, both of whom you can find on your program. They will be joined by a couple of other folks. They represent important community partners and agencies in the Minneapolis area. And they're here to listen to the conference and tell us over lunch tomorrow what they heard that seemed important, what they will take away from it, as well as what they didn't hear, but that they think bears attention in the future going forward. So we're very excited to have them as well as our third panel variety. So we hope to have a lively Q&A after each panel. Um, we also hope to stay very much on time. So I hope folks will be considerate, um, use hands, wait for the microphones to come around in the Q&A session. And we encourage you to really ask questions about the big picture implications of what you've heard today. Um, and help us to reflect, again, on the larger question that's drawn us here. Please do keep in mind that the conference is public. It's being live streamed and recorded, just so you're aware of that as you think about um, question time. So with that, I am pleased to introduce our first panel. I have Fatih Guvenin, who is the Curtis Carlson Professor of Economics at the University of Minnesota. Greg Kaplan, Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. Moritz Kuhn, Professor of Economics at the University of Bonn, and Isabel Cairo, Senior Economist at the Federal Reserve Board. Um, they'll each have 30 minutes, and then we'll take, um, I'll open it as the moderator with a couple of questions for them, and then open the floor to Q&A. Thanks so much. It's a great honor to be here and uh, to talk about uh, distributional consequences uh, of the cycle. Today I'm going to talk about uh, two interrelated topics. One is inequality, and that's a very big question. We all talk about it. And um, <clears throat> today we are going to tr try to bring kind of a new angle on that. 
Um, and the bulk of my talk will be on a second topic that's intimately related, and that is income uncertainty. Um, so we all know, I think, you know, this has been uh, one of the very well-known facts that in the last 40 years, uh, income inequality in the United States has increased tremendously. Um, so one way to think about that, about inequality, is that it is how dispersed incomes are across individuals. So this is a statement about the levels of income. But uh, something that's very closely related is what is the dispersion in income changes from year to year? And this is a different notion because it's about the volatility of income and it's a proxy, it's a measure for the uncertainty that households individuals face. So what do we know about what has happened to income uncertainty? We know inequality has risen. What happened to income uncertainty? Well, the, uh, the, a seminal paper in the 1990s by Gottschalk and Moffitt, and Moffitt and Gottschalk, uh, basically documented that uh, from 1970 to 1988, uh, there was a large rise in income volatility. Uh, this has been followed by a lot of work. There's about uh, 30 papers. There's a recent paper by Dynan, Elmendorf, and Siegel. If you read it, they survey about 30 papers after Gottschalk and Moffitt. And 27 of these find a rise in income volatility. Two find flat and one find a drop. Now, 29 of these papers are from survey data. They are from the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, the CPS, or the SIP. And maybe you can already kind of uh, conjecture, the one that finds declining volatility is actually from administrative data. These are from records rather than asking individuals. You know, you look directly at the, 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 the record of how much they were paid. So today what I'm going to talk about is a, a, a paper with the authors I've shown at the beginning, uh, which I forgot to mention, uh, Nick Bloom, Luigi Pistaferi from Stanford, uh, Sergio Salgado from Wharton, John Sablehouse from the board, and uh, Jay Song from the Social Security Administration. What we are going to find basically, I'm, re I'm going to relate to this picture that you see. So I would like you to keep what you see here in mind. I'm going to show you the contrast in a few minutes, okay? So this is like, uh, you know, um, we take the same data set, the pa panel study of income dynamics, and here I am plotting, oop, take some time. Um, I am plotting the standard deviation, a dispersion measure, of two-year income growth for individuals. Okay, take a lot of individuals, calculate the two-year income growth, look at the dispersion. As you can see here, from 1970 on, there's a large surge in this volatility measure. And this is what I have been, you know, summarizing as uh, what we know so far. Now, just to uh, drive this point further, uh, I like this quote, it's from a very good paper, very uh, influential paper by Lindquist and Sargent in Econometrica. And they, they basically cite Jim Hackman. Basically based on, on a lot of research, this is how he summarized uh, the, what we know. Uh, it says a growing body of evidence points to the fact that the world economy is more variable and less predictable than it was 30 years ago. There's more variability and unpredictability in economic life. And I think a lot of us kind of, this is almost part of conventional wisdom now. That's how we feel compared to, you know, the uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and this is an interesting quote because it is one Nobel Prize winner, Tom Sargent, citing another Nobel Prize winner, Jim Hackman. So how can you go wrong, right? <clears throat> now, um, the catch is what I mentioned at the beginning. You know, there is nothing wrong with any of these papers in terms of the, what they do. But they had to rely, because of data availability, uh, on, on various kind of uh, small uh, micro surveys. Today, what we are going to actually move on to administrative data <coughs> or big data, and we are going to find something quite different. Uh, we find that individual income volatility in the US actually has fallen by about by one third since 1980. Then we are going to go from individuals to firms, and we are going to look at the volatility in firms, how much their employment changed from year to year, how much their wage bill changed from year to year. And we are going to find that that has also fallen by about one third. Now, the title of the paper basically refers to the well-known great macro moderation that during the same period, you know, macroeconomists have talked about. And what we find, you can view it as the micro counterpart of that. 
one uh, result that we have, and I won't have too much time to talk about this, but if you are kind of wondering, are these two related, the firm volatility declining and the worker volatility? They are. Part of the decline in wages of workers, the volatility, comes from their employers now being less volatile than before. Now, is there a link to macro and micro? Uh, we are still investigating that. You know, we don't have a final answer to that. There seems to be a lot of suggestive evidence, but that's basically uh, also the conne connection to the conference, right? That the macro policy or macroeconomic conditions, how do they interact with micro? And both of them seem to have moderated during the same time, since the 1970s. <clears throat> so I'll briefly talk about the data very quickly, then I will show you our main results. And then I'm going to basically uh, show how robust they are, you know, and, and some other implications. So the data uh, comes from the Social Security Administration uh, called the Master Earnings File. And this is basically the, uh, the, the, really the master earnings file. It includes every individual in the United States who has a social security number uh, since 1978 until 2013. Um, you can basically work, not work, you can leave the country, come back, you are always in the sample. Okay, the, the, it's always basically uh, in there. Um, it does not have too many demographics, but it has uh, the gender, date of birth, place, place of birth, you know, when a person dies and so on. Crucially, it has a variable that's very helpful to us. Uh, uh, you know the uh, employer identification number of the worker at every job that they have, and that will allow us to link to the employer and what's going on at the employer level. When you have the entire universe of all individuals and you know where each one work, you can construct a data set on all the US basically firms. And then we can look at you know, how the two are link, uh, linked to each other, what happens to the firm, how does it affect what happens to the worker. Um, we have some uh, additional data. We can actually extend the analysis to 1957. Uh, in the interest of time today, I'm not going to talk about that. But the results I show you kind of um, are a bit different. I will tell you how they look. There is a small increase in the 70s, and uh, the rest is flat before basically uh, 1970. <clears throat> so the sample selection, the basic sample is, you know, working age individuals, 25 to 64. Uh, when you do an analysis like this, we don't want to include individuals who don't work at all, okay? They have zero income, they're out of the labor force. So we impose a minimum uh, income condition at the annual level, which is a standard condition, and we do a lot of robustness. We are going to change those and see if, if the results change. Um, in the base, uh, baseline, we are going to drop education and the public sector, um, but we, we also have looked at them. They, they don't look uh, very different. They, you see the same pattern there too. Um, okay, so what do we find? Oh, okay. So um, this picture is the analog of the picture I showed you from the PSID, where the graph was trending up, the volatility was going up, but this is now done from the US administrative data. Uh, it's from W2 records that are aggregated at the annual level for each individual. And you see quite a different pattern. It doesn't slope up, it actually goes down throughout this uh, 30 year period. Now, the standard deviation, as we know, puts some weight to outliers as well. This is administrative data, so measurement error is not a big issue. It's actually a very small uh, deal. But still, we don't want some trends to be driven by just a few individuals here and there. So uh, another measure that, that we like is robust to these extremes, to the tails. Uh, it's the 90-10 ratio. So if you think about you know, the entire distribution of growth rates, you take the 90th percentile of the growth rate from one year to another, uh, in the cross-section, and you take the 10th percentile. So those whose incomes have grown a lot between those two years and those who have fallen a lot, and how dispersed are those? How dispersed are the outcomes? And uh, this is what you see. This is the 90-10 differential. We take the log so it's easier to read. Um, the black one is everyone, men, women combined. Uh, the red line is women and the blue line is uh, uh, men. And as you can see, they all go down together. So this is not about just some outliers here and there. It's happening to the bulk of the earnings growth distribution. Now, um, one question that you know, we may wonder, why are they different? Why do we get different, so different answers from uh, surveys? 
um, and administrative data. Um, so a lot of the work, I think probably 25 or 26 out of the 30 I mentioned, they use the panel study of income dynamics. And it's a wonderful data set. There has been 4,000 papers written with it. I wrote several in this audience, you know, a lot of us have written. And there's a lot of, you know, genuine, real, important uh, 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 information in there. However, when you look over a long period of time, which we do here, then some ba basically uh, disadvantages, some drawbacks of it start to appear. And I will just quickly point out a few of them. The first one is representativeness. PSID is interesting in the sense that the way it's designed, it tracks households that were included in 1968, and it tracks its offsprings and people that that group of people married. Now, one issue is if you track over time and look at how is the composition of PSID different than the United States overall you know, population, you see some differences. The first one is there's large cumulative attrition, meaning that, for example, by 1980, 13 years after it started, about 40% of the original households were not there anymore. By 1989, about half of them were not there anymore. Now, this could be okay. If, if people are dropping out of the study randomly, they always, you know, it always happens to every survey, that's fine. But uh, there's evidence, and, and uh, Moffitt and Gottschalk, the same authors, uh, teamed up with uh, uh, Moffitt, Gottschalk, and Fitzgerald, they did a validation study, and what they found was that there's a lot of systematic nature to the attrition. Now, I'm not going to go more on this, but there's actually right now an effort to reconcile the results because we like the PSID, we have learned a lot from it, and on what, you know, in what dimensions do we see this difference, and in what dimension we actually find the same results. So let me go back to uh, our results. Um, how about this like, you know, broad result that applies to the entire US economy? Does it hold within different subgroups in the population? And it turns out to be surprisingly robust. Um, we have looked at, like, for example, instead of one-year growth rate, you look at five-year growth rates. You can separately look at what happened to positive shocks and negative shocks, whether, you know, whether one type of shock became less likely as opposed to the other. You can look at the entire income distribution and say what happened to you know, workers with high income, low income, have they experienced different degrees of decline, uh, industry, geography, and so on. I'm going to show you like a subset of these just to give you kind of a, a better idea. Uh, the first one is just look at the five year because five year income change often carries more information about persistent changes in income. Because one year it can be a transitory change and maybe it is the transitory shocks that are becoming less volatile. But the ones that are persistent that we care about maybe they are still the same. And you don't see that. You, you, we look at that five year, we have done a, a number of other things. They all seem to be declining uh, together. Um, one question, and actually this is like a, uh, let me back up for a second. When Moffitt and Gottschalk, you know, in their seminal paper, when they, they, they documented that uh, income volatility was going up, that was taken as far as I know, like universally as a bad thing. You know, I don't know anybody who said, oh, maybe that's good, you know, volatility goes up. Because we thought risk, there's more risk in the economy and we don't like that. Now, so you might guess, well, if we find that volatility is going down, that must be a good thing. But actually, it's not quite. We are not so sure, right? Because we are thinking, well, maybe it is related to another set of facts that economists have been talking about recently, which is uh, uh, a lot of like mobility measures and some people call it business dynamism, uh, they have also been declining. So maybe decline in volatility actually shows that there's not as much dynamism. People are not moving around. Their wages are not changing. They're not getting promotions. One way we are going to look at that, and this is not you know, conclusive, it's one picture, but it, it, it speaks to that, is to look separately at the top end of the income growth distribution and the bottom end. By that, what I mean is, you can look at, you know, relative to the median income growth in a year, there are a lot of people who get income growth, right? And uh, there's a dispersion of that. So some people get 20%, 30 40 50% income growth. We want to know what happens to the dispersion. Because if people are not getting, you know, promoted, if upward moves are getting less, 
and that upside distribution collapses, that is a bad sign, right? However, if what is happening is the low end, meaning that individuals who get basically their income fall by 10, 20, 30%, if that is getting compressed, people are not experiencing that, that big, big drop, then maybe that's a good sign. And when you separately look at both of them, the red one, oh, the red one is um, um, the, the upside shocks, and black one is the downward shocks. There is some volatility. This is actually also uh, incidentally related to business cycles, that uh, the nature of income volatility changes over the business cycle. But I will point out the trend. Both of them trend pretty much at the same rate. So looking at this, we cannot like, this is like a smell test. It's not a proof, but you know, I thought actually we were gonna find, maybe I'm pessimistic, I, I thought we were gonna find more decline in the upside shocks and not as much in downward, but we didn't find that. Now, another angle I want to show you, this is one of my favorite pictures because the, the distribution of any object over the entire you know, uh, economy is such a complicated object that you know, something can change in one part of it and can drive the overall results, but the rest actually might have a different pattern. So in this figure, what we do, we take individuals uh, in, in, the, in our sample, which is uh, basically tens of millions of individuals, and we follow them for five years, um, predating those dates that you see. Okay, 19, uh, uh, 1980, 1995, 2005, and 2012. And we calculate their average income over that five year period. That's a proxy for their permanent income, where they rank kind of in the income distribution. And what we look at is for each one of these income, permanent income percentile groups, what happens to the volatility of their income change going forward. In other words, we want to understand whether the decline that we see overall in the economy, how does it look for different income groups in the population? And uh, I normalized 1980, uh, 1985, sorry, 1985 to, to, to zero. So, these lines show you the change relative to 1985. And as you can see, all of them are below zero. What that means is between 85 and 95, I'll talk about this in just a second, for almost every group, income volatility has declined. Between 95 and 2012, there was another big decline. So by the time you are here, that's about a 30% decline in volatility. Now, the decline here, um, is it genuine or not? There's, there are some technical issues at the lower end with truncation. So I don't want to put too much weight on that, but if you want to take this seriously, you can say that, well, it actually has declined maybe a bit less at the bottom end. And there's always some, you know, if you're wondering about this, this is like a very, very general picture. You always see something slightly different or sometimes very different for top 1%, top 2%, and so on. Okay, let's look at by industry. Is it true across all industries? And what you see here, you know, if you see, well, I see a bunch of line, I cannot tell which one is which. That's part of the point. They all look the same. And these are all different industries like mining, construction, manufacturing, a trade, wholesale, retail, uh, uh, fire, meaning uh, finance, insurance, and real estate, and services. So about half of the US economy now is services. It's the red line. And as you can see, it has gone down by about 40% uh, or so. So it's very broad based. Um, another angle that you, know, uh, you, you may wonder about, how does this look, the declining volatility, for workers who stayed at their job between two years and those who, for whatever reason, have moved between two jobs? So uh, a move can be either a job-to-job -job transition or it can be somebody who lost their job and got a new job. And what you see is, uh, again, the black, the black line is everyone. It's the previous picture I showed you, rescaled here. The red is stayers. And uh, the blue is switchers, those who switch jobs. There's more volatility for them, you know, and there's something going on uh, clearly here. But the overall pattern is down for all of them. You know, there's cyclicality here that um, I'm happy to talk about later if there are any questions on this. But, <clears throat> oh, the shadings are business cycle dates. And our business cycle notion is a bit different because we look at uh, unemployment. So the bands are wider than just MBER dates. Um, now I want to talk a few, for a few minutes about firms. 
the employers of these individuals. And I'm just going to show you like a subset of the results. You know, th 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 there's quite a bit going on there. Um, but uh, linking this again to the dynamism discussion, you know, uh, <clears throat> what do we find if we, instead of looking at the distribution of workers, we now look at the distribution of employers in the United States. And for each employer, we calculate over a one-year horizon, two-year horizon, the change in the employment. Some shrink, some grow. There's a distribution of that. Okay? So <clears throat> uh, if you track them over time, the uh, blue line is employment growth. And overall, it, 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 it's, uh, uh, it's going downward. And if you look at the wage bill growth, again, it's trending downward. So um, we have some results where we analyze, you know, through, we have a you know, regression analysis where we look individual by individual and firm by firm. We look at the volatility change for a given worker and the change in volatility for the employer. And there is a significant pass-through. When the volatility of the firm declines, a significant part of that is translated into less volatility for the worker who works there. Um, this is again also broadly true across industries. Uh, there's like manufacturing and fire uh, are partial exceptions. So one of them is um, manufacturing, like the, if you look at uh, this one, it's actually not trending down as much. And if you look at fire, it's the green one. Again, you actually get like an upward and then a downward. But for the rest, you kind of see the same downward trend we saw for wages. Um, now, in the last uh, five minutes or so, I want to now bring back the discussion to inequality. And the link, there's, there's an intimate link between the two. So one reason the results of Moffitt and Gottschalk were, um, I think, very quickly you know, uh, uh, adopted in the literature was because if you have a world in which individuals get larger and larger income shocks, it's not hard to see that that will generate more inequality. So we already knew that inequality went up. And when Moffitt and Gottschalk came and they said, well, income shocks are getting larger, we said, that makes sense. You know, if the first one happens, the second one probably is expected. But now we are saying something different. In this paper, we are saying income volatility actually is declining. So how do we reconcile the two? Why is inequality going up if volatility is going down? So let me make this a bit more clear. This is an identity, this is a very simple equation that you can write, where um, take the log wage or log income of uh, an individual I and difference it. And take the dispersion in that, that is the variance, the, the volatility measure I showed you. You can write this mechanically as the sum of the variance of the level, okay, not the change, of income at T, T, income at T plus one. So together this is two times the inequality, roughly speaking. And you also have a covariance term between the income today and income tomorrow. Now, this is the measure of inequality, which is going up. This is the measure of volatility, which is going down. So what must happen is this term that you see here, okay, must also be going up. That's the only way this is an identity for it to work. Now, what does that mean? It means, well, incomes are becoming more persistent over time. But there is more than one way that can happen. Again, if we think in the context of like the previous research about idiosyncratic shocks being very large, one natural you know, way to think is maybe each shock is be becoming more persistent than before. And that will get you this. Um, now, this is actually a joint paper with, with Greg Kaplan, where we look at lifetime inequality using a similar data set. And in that paper, we look at this. You know, is it really the income shocks becoming more persistent? It will have some implications about the slope of the age inequality profile. And you don't see much evidence of that. But there's another possibility. The other possibility is that incomes could become more persistent over time if the new cohorts that enter the US economy during this period, they started with larger inequality among them. So imagine a world where basically, you know, we all start at the same level, but then shocks drive us apart. There's a good chance that we'll crisscross, right? So the covariance or correlation of income over time will not be very high. But if we start very far apart and you have the same shocks, 
income today and income tomorrow will be highly correlated because somebody who is above the average today will be above average tomorrow. So this is a, a, a figure. Uh, this is the one I actually want to, to uh, uh, emphasize. This is, a, this is a picture from uh, my paper with Greg. Each of these circles is the 90-10 differential inequality measure for workers at age 25 in that year. And this is for males. So if you trace the line, you basically see what is happening to initial inequality of males pretty much when they started you know, uh, uh, th th their career. And this inequality declined for about 10 years from 57 to 1969. And after that date, there's almost like a straight rise, except for like a 10-year kind of hiatus here. Now, this is in log scale. So uh, if you exponentiate this, let me tell you the numbers. In 1969, 25-year-old males in the US economy, the ratio of the 90th percentile male to the 10th percentile male, the wage ratio was about 3.3. If you look at 2012, that ratio is now 9. So for whatever reason, somehow the newer cohorts look very different from the older ones by the time they enter the market. And we look at in detail at this. Is it that their, their career experience as they work is that different from the older cohorts? Of course, we cannot do this for the very latest one, but we can do these intermediate ones. They don't look that different. Their growth rate of income as they get older is a bit slower, but this is a, a, a very big change of a ratio of three for whatever reason, now it's nine. Um, one takeaway from this that, that I have, and these are preliminary thoughts, I don't have results, you know, but this to me says that we talk so much about inequality, and when we talk about inequality, there's a, a lot of emphasis on topics, and I don't mean to basically, you know, uh, <clears throat> say that they are not important. They are important, but we talk a lot about, you know, labor market issues. We talk about, you know, trades, you know, unions. We talk about, you know, trade, uh, 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 technology, structural change. Those are all probably important, but these graphs say that something is different before they get to the labor market, and what is it? I don't know, and, but we have some thoughts. Uh, maybe it is actually schooling that is changing over time. You know, my colleagues actually, Alessandro Fogli and Veronica Guerrieri, they have a very nice paper on this. Others have been working about this. Or it might be something else. Um, but maybe we should be looking before actually these workers entered, how they are different from the old ones. Um, I will conclude. Um, our first result is that we find evidence for great micro-moderation. Uh, meaning that it's happening both at worker level and at uh, the firm level. Um, if you just want like a, you know, um, bottom line number, the earnings growth variance more or less falls about one third. To me, like it's not really the magnitude that is so crucial. It is that for all these years, you know, myself and a lot of us, we, we taught to our students and we thought that was actually happening, that incomes were becoming more and more volatile. And now we explained a lot of changes in the US economy by taking that as given. That was kind of what we fed as one of the changes that happened and explained other things. Now, if volatility really wasn't going up, it was going down, then we have to rethink, I think, a lot of those questions about now, okay, how do we explain them now? Um, the decline, like I said, is pervasive. There are very few exceptions in the, uh, in the subgroups that we have looked at. Um, and the link to macro moderation, I think it's a very interesting question. We have some preliminary results on that. Um, but that's something, you know, that's the direction kind of in which we are going, trying to understand the macro to micro link. And that's all I have. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Fatih. Thank you, so I was here, um, maybe it was two years ago, one of these conferences um, at, at an OIGI event. And one of the things I started out with was by trying to make the point that for the vast majority of households in the United States, whether or not they are successful in enjoying in our nation's prosperity, it depends crucially on their outcomes in the labor market. And then I went on to add that we needed to 
dig a bit deeper to try and understand what it is about changes in the macro environment in terms of aggregate shocks and aggregate policies that leads to different types of people having different outcomes in the labor market and how the in labor income distribution is affected by uh, macroeconomic conditions. Um, now, after that talk, several people came up to me and justifiably criticized me for too much chit chat and talking about what it is that we should be doing and not enough actually doing. So uh, what I thought I'd do today is tell you about the work that I've been trying to get, get started on over the last couple of years to try and actually make progress on exactly this question. Now, um, so this is work with uh, Piotr Zock, who's a grad student at, at Chicago. So this is very preliminary. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the theory and tell you basically the idea behind what we want to do. Um, and the numbers that I show you are kind of more illustrative than anything else. So if you think about the basic framework that we have for thinking about macroeconomic effects on inequality and distributional effects of shocks, it's the class of heterogeneous agent models, which have become essentially ubiquitous in macroeconomics. Now, anyone who's worked with these models knows like the dirty secret of these models is that they're fantastic framework for thinking about the effects of the economic environment on consumption and wealth inequality, but they have very, very little to say about the fundamental determinant of inequality in those models, which is labor market inequality. In pretty much every one of this class of models I've seen, either the labor, labor market distribution is exogenous, or to the extent that it moves around, it moves around in ways which are kind of hardwired in to match some important facts that like Fadi, for example, and others have noted about the fact that different people are exposed differently to how things happen in the business cycle. So what I want to do in this, um, in this kind of research agenda is to develop a framework that we can use to understand how the labor income distribution itself is affected by aggregate shocks and policies and why it is related to economic fundamentals, the fundamental production structure of the economy, that different types of people might be differentially affected by certain shocks. Now, the focus, my entry point into doing this, is going to be on markups. Okay? Now, why markups? Well, for two reasons. If you understand how uh, sticky price and new Keynesian models work, models with nominal rigidities, you understand that the, the, the mechanism through which uh, things like monetary policy, or really any type of aggregate demand shock, affects the economy is by changing markups. And I'm going to show you that by, looking, by understanding how markups affect the labor market distribution, it's going to naturally just translate into how does monetary policy affect the labor income distribution. And that's where um, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is related, I think, to the theme of this conference. The same framework is going to be useful, and what we're working on is to think about changes in the long run. There's been a huge amount of attention recently on uh, trends and changes in the nature of product market competition and the natures of technology that is showing up in different measures of profitability and, and different measures of concentration across U.S. firms. So the same framework that I'm going to put down, we're using to think about how those changes in markups over the long run translate into the labor market inequality. Okay, so what's the idea? The idea behind this is really to start with the class of heterogeneous agent New Keynesian models and make a very, very simple change. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a second type of worker into these economies. Okay, so in this class of models, there's going to be workers are going to contribute to aggregate production in two different ways. The first way, which is kind of the standard way, is that workers, by working, will contribute to the marginal production of existing goods. Okay? I'm going to allow for a second way in which second type of activity that uh, some workers do, which I'm going to refer to as overhead, but I also kind of mean marketing or sales or research and development. I mean a lot of things. The economic difference between the two types of workers, I'm going to say precisely as follows, the distinction is whether or not these type of workers contribute to the aggregate productive capacity of the economy by moving along a demand curve or by shifting out a demand curve. Now, there's many ways in which a worker might shift out a demand curve. It might be by creating a new product. It might be by taking the same product and selling it to a different demographic or geographic market. It might be simply by uh, engaging in sales and marketing activities that change the willingness of consumers to pay for certain products. There's many different ways in which you can do it. What they all have in common is that when markups change, either through by, as, as of the result of a monetary policy shock or as the result of an aggregate demand shock or some other deeper fundamental, what it does is shift input demand between these different types of workers. Okay? And that's going to be the basic idea. And I'm going to relate that to why it is that some people in doing different types of things are differentially affected by uh, monetary policy and other types of aggregate demand. Okay. Now, 
the framework I'm going to produce, I, I, I put down the table for those who understand uh, the literature on kind of new Keynesian models and uh, business cycle models. It's also going to have some other appealing features, which are kind of obvious once you see them. Um, in addition to connecting the factor income distribution to the personal income distribution in a very kind of uh, precise way, I'm going to, the model is going to have some very nice features that I'm going to show you are consistent with uh, empirical evidence. Kind of the holy grail of nominal rigidity models is how do you get pro-cyclical profits with counter-cyclical markups or kind of the converse of that, a counter-cyclical labor share with pro-cyclical real wages. This model is just going to come, come out so naturally, it's kind of going to say, why, why not? And I'll show, you, I'll show you why we haven't been focusing on it. Okay, so that's, the, that's where I want to get to. Um, here's my agenda. Most of what I'm going to talk about today um, for the next uh, like 13 minutes or so, I want to explain the theory, but I'm going to do it in a representative agent model because you can understand all of the forces without inequality. Um, and then the natural idea is just, they, they're just going to follow very simply into the heterogeneous agent framework. The representative agent framework is going to suggest that there's a need to go out and do some new measurement, basically to understand which are the workers in the US economy that look more like the first type of workers versus the second type of workers, who they are and how many of them. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about our strategy for doing that, which essentially boils down to looking at shifts in the labor share distribution across occupations, so the occupational labor shares in response to monetary shocks and other types of aggregate demand shocks. I'm not. I had some numbers to show you. I decided to kind of put them at the back because they're a little bit preliminary, but I'll tell you the basic idea for the strategy. And then at the end of the talk, in the last couple of minutes, I'll show you some illustrative um, uh, e examples from embedding this idea into a full-blown heterogeneous agent New Keynesian model, where I can show you that uh, the distributional consequences of monetary policy shock on the labor income distribution. And that's kind of where we're trying to get to, and hopefully we'll get there. Okay. Okay, so um, let me explain how, how this works. I said the, the model is going to be very standard. There's representative household that is preferences over consumption and, um, and labor supply, where consumption is an aggregator of a number of n, a measure n, of different varieties, for lack of a, a better word. But uh, keep in mind, that I don't want you to think of these varieties in the sense of like literally a new product. These are gonna, these are, you'll see that these really are about um, differences across the demand curves that produ producers face, producers operate under. Okay, so um, they consume a constant RCC aggregator. Where, I, to be clear, that this is everything that I talk about has nothing to do with love of variety effects. We could we could add them from the outset. I'm going to I'm going to kill all effects from love of variety. So that's not what's going to be going on here. Um, the demand for each variety is going to be a standard uh, a constant elasticity demand function. And so the representative household is going to have a budget constraint where they spend on consumption, have labor income and profit income. In this version, this representative agent simple version, there's only going to be two types of factor income. There's going to be labor income and profit income. In the full-blown Hank model, there's going to be capital income as well. Okay, I'm going to describe the production structure in two steps because there's two sectors in this economy. That's really the, the change relative to the standard model. The first sector is a wholesale sector in which there's a measure one of, uh, of wholesalers who hire production labor, which I'm going to denote by Y, L-Y, production labor, in a competitive market to produce a homogenous intermediate good, which I call M, that they sell in a competitive market. So they maximize profits, which is the wholesale price that they sell these goods at, minus the cost of their labor. And I'm going to allow at this point for some potentially decreasing returns to scale in production, where theta Y is a really crucial parameter at the level of decreasing returns to scale in the, uh, in the production of, um, of this intermediate good. Pi Y is the profits that are earned by this wholesale sector. Okay, that's the wholesale sector. The second sector is the, is the retail sector. Um, and I'm going to describe that in two parts. I'm going to describe it in parts of a product creation and a pricing, and a pricing, uh, pricing part. So the retail sector also consists of a measure one of retailers. And they're going to hire labor that I'll call overhead labor. I'll denote that by LN. Okay? And what those overhead labor do is they manage product lines, or they can manage markets, or they manage the different operations, might be establishments of the, of the different, um, of the different uh, goods that, this, uh, that the, the producers um, sell. And what the job is, of the, what the decision is, is to decide how many of these product lines to operate, where um, each product line generates some gross profits pi j. So pi j is the profits per product line, and I'll define what that is on the next slide. It's just going to come from the monopolistic competition. 
And, but the, the cost is that if you want to operate more product lines, you have to hire more overhead labor. And I'm going to allow, again, for some potentially decreasing returns to scale. You can think of like a span of control type uh, um, argument, where this parameter theta n governs the level of decreasing returns to scale. Theta n will be another important parameter. What are these profits that they earn per, per product line? Well, that's going to become straight out of your standard, your standard monopolistic competition model. Each, the pricing department of these, of these different goods, of these different, um, for each different sector, they take the homogenous goods as their only input. They costlessly transform them into these differentiated goods, and then they decide how many of them to produce and sell, subject to their downward sloping demand curve, and the, and the, 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 the input demand, which is that the, the, fra the number of goods that we sell in the output market must be equal to the number of, of goods that we buy. Okay, that's super standard. Now, you all know that the uh, um, solution to that problem is to set, a constant, set the price as a constant markup over marginal cost, which I'll denote as mu star, the optimal flexible price markup. And for the next like five minutes or so, I want to think about um, hypothetically what would happen if this markup was different to this optimal mu star. So I'll introduce a markup wedge, and I'll think about the markup as being some value mu, which is different from mu star. And I'm going to talk about what happens as we change mu, and then I'm just going to tell you that we have a lemma that everything I tell you about uh, what happens to mu is exactly the same as what happens in response to a monetary policy shock in a full-blown full model or another aggregate demand shock. Okay, so that's the model. Super simple. That's all it is. The equilibrium is that the final goods market must clear, the intermediate goods market must clear. The only thing that you should probably point out is that two things. In the labor market clearing condition, the total labor supplied by this representative household is uh, equal to the, the overhead labor plus the production labor, where the LY is the, the, the number of workers that are required in each, or number of hours that are required, I guess, in each of the different, um, the, in each of the different goods. Okay. In the heterogeneous agent version of the model, these will be different people, perhaps, to some level. Okay? And the other thing to note is that aggregate output, C, is comprised of two parts, N times Y. Okay, good. Before I go any further, I want to just uh, take, a, take, take a, an aside and talk about returns to scale. So um, this, is, this is important. So I want to ask the following question. Imagine that we double the total amount of labor inputs into the economy. What is the condition under which, in equilibrium, the total amount of output would also uh, double? So what do we need for total output to be homogenous of degree one of total labor in this economy? And the answer is that this condition has to hold. Either theta y must equal 1, or theta n equals 1. Or you could have both. Empirically, both is not going to be a good fit. But uh, So either theta n equals theta y equals 1. So I want to focus only on constant returns to scale economies. So from now on, I'm going to consider two types of constant returns to scale economies, theta y equals 1 and theta n equals 1. And I'm going to tell you exactly how they differ. They differ in very important ways, and which is the one you used to see. OK. This is kind of, if you haven't understood anything up to now, this is probably the most important part of the talk because this is all I'm trying to get to. Okay, so all that was to try to get to this. It's what's in this box up here. What do the factor shares look like in this economy? So the factor shares, there's, well, factor, the total aggregate income in the economy is going to go to two places. It's going to go to labor and it's going to go to profits. And amongst labor, it's going to go to two different types of workers, production workers and overhead workers. And there's going to be two sources of profits in the economy. There's the standard retail profits, which, I'll call re which are basically rents that accrue to um, markups, monopolistic competition. And then there's also going to be wholesale profits, which are, you can think of as rents as accruing to a fixed factor. They come from decreasing returns to scale. OK. Now, I want to point out two differences between these two different types of economies. The economy with theta y equals 1, in that economy, all the profits are retail profits. They come from rents to monopolistic uh, competition. That's where the standard one sector model that you're used to thinking about lives. That the standard one sector model is theta y equals 1, theta n equals 0. Theta n equals 0 means that all workers in the economy are standard work production line workers. Okay? The other possibility is theta n equals 1. In that case, all the profits in the economy should be thought of as returns to fixed factors. Okay? There's no retail profits. It's all wholesale profits. OK. Good. You're wondering, where am I going with this? So here's where I'm going. I'm going to give you four observations now about markups that follow directly from the, what was on that last slide. And then I'm going to give you my interpretation of what this means. So observation number one, markups re redistribute income between overhead and production labor. An increase in markup 
always reduces the share of labor income that goes to production labor and increases the share of labor that goes to um, overhead, uh, overhead workers. A change in markups redistributes labor income between these two types of workers. Observation number two. Markups also redistribute income between the people who have the claims to profits and workers, between labor income and profit income. But which way does it go? Well, it's ambiguous, and it's ambiguous in a very particular way. Whether or not the labor share increases, oops, sorry, increases with markups depends only on whether theta n is bigger or less than theta y. Now, because I already told you that only one of those, one of those needs to be one, because that's the only way we get constant returns to scale, whether or not the labor share increases or decreases with markups is going to be extremely informative about whether we live in a world which looks more like one where a lot of most of the or all of the workers do the first activity or whether some of the workers also do the other activity. For example, in New Keynesian models where mu is um, markup is extremely countercyclical, and it will be in my model as well, the cyclicality of the labor share then is going to be extremely informative about the relative size of theta n and theta y. Observation number three, a change in markups can have, in theory, an ambiguous effect on output. Remember, output in this economy moves for two reasons. It moves because we produce more of the same types of goods or because we start servicing additional markets. This is kind of a standard thing that if you've, anyone's thought about expanded variety models would know. Um, well, in the case where theta y equals 1, we can show that you know, the intensive margin always dominates. And that's why markups are counter-cyclical in very standard models. In the other case, which is the case I'm going to leave you with in 13 minutes as thinking that this is the relevant case, um, either of them can dominate. But the extensive margin really only dominates in very extreme economies, extreme versions of this, where almost all of the labor is used in uh, uh, production or almost labor is used in output. What you can show is in intermediate economies, you're still going to get the standard counter-cyclical markups that a change in marker, an increase in markups leads to a decrease in total output. And the fourth um, observation is that everything that I just told you, the first three, extend to monetary shocks and aggregate demand shocks in sticky price New Keynesian versions of the model. Okay, so you can just translate everything I've told you as um, claims about monetary policy shocks. Okay, so what? Let me show you some data. So this is data from uh, Brent and Lucas's recent uh, MBR macroannual paper. Some of you might have seen it. I just take, took it straight from them. This is the labor share from their, from, from their paper. Um, the shaded lines are just, the, in this case, the MBR dated recessions. That is one of the most countercyclical series you will ever see. Every single recession is associated with a local maximum of that series. You can argue about how you measure the labor share. You will never get that thing to go in the other direction. The labor share is countercyclical. Okay. Profit share, well, there's two different notions of profits. You can think about accounting profits. Accounting profits are just the inverse of the labor share, so that's extremely pro-cyclical. Economic profits, more difficult. Brent and Lucas have a whole paper thinking about how you, how you uh, um, might assign returns to capital versus economic profits. This is one of their versions. This is the one they call case pi. It's where you assign the most of the remaining fact, what they call factorless income to profits. It's true for any of them. That is one of the more uh, pro-cyclical series you'll ever see. Every recession is associated with a local minimum. Okay, what do I take from that? Well, if you're generating shocks through, at least through demand type shocks in uh, these class of models, that's consistent only with an economy where theta n is bigger than theta y, which suggests that measured profits, what we're seeing in economic profits, ref look like they reflect much more returns to fixed factors than they do reflect rents, on, um, uh, that, rents that come from markups. Now, you might worry that, oh, Greg, this is completely, this is a, uh, uh, unconditional series. There's a lot of other things that are moving things in the round, not just demand shocks and monetary shocks. Well, we can do the same thing by just looking at monetary policy shocks. So, and that's, I'm going to make, I'm going to make use of that in my uh, um, application in, in one minute. Um, so I'll show you um, what the labor share response to, to a monetary, monetary policy shock. In a lovely paper by Cantori, Ferroni, and Leon Ledesma, they estimate impulse responses of the labor share to monetary shocks in five different economies using basically all the different methods of identification under the sun. Okay? What do they find? The labor share is, 
is a strong, robust, negative correlation between output and out, between, between output and the labor share in response to a uh, monetary policy shock. Monetary policy shocks are contractionary, and they lead to an increase in the labor share. The elasticity is big; it's around minus 0.5. Okay, so when in response to a contractionary monetary policy shock, the labor share goes up. Okay, so that suggests. So, okay, what does that all suggest? I, I have a slide where what, what, what do I want you to do? If you haven't understood any of what I've said so far, let me kind of summarize what I take away from this. The existing literature, the macro literature, has focused on production structures that look very much like the industrial production structure of the 19th century. What, lab what workers do is they shift production up and down demand curves. There are no labor, there's no types of labor that look like N, which is, that means, that in other words, theta N equals zero. But like, Casual just inspection of reality of what actual peep workers do suggests that there's kind of a lot of people out there that do stuff that look more like shifting, enga engaging activities that look like more like shifting out demand curves. What this analysis has shown is that those types of workers have labor income that has properties with respect to the macro economy that look much more like profit income than, the, than like labor income, than, than, like than like traditional the way we think about workers. That's a, if those workers exist, it suggests that theta n is greater than zero. What I've done is shown you a set of economies, effectively, indexed by these three parameters, which you can calibrate to have the same overall level and profit, profit share, but will differ in terms of how the labor and profit share respond to aggregate shocks. They, it nests the two, like, two extreme cases, one extreme case being our standard New Keynesian model, and I'll be a little bit mysterious and say that the other extreme case where everybody's in the N and none are in the Y is really like the Diamond Mortens and Pizzarides model, but that seems mysterious. Leave it that way. Um, but these economies differ both in terms of what economic profits are, whether they return to fixed factors or rents or markups, and they're crucial in understanding how the economy responds to shocks. So because the data strongly prefers a theta n equals 1 than theta y equals 1, that basically means that the conventional setup is kind of rejected by the data and suggests that there are at least some workers in the economy who look like they are shifting, work, shifting demand curves out. So that leads to me to kind of the next phase of the project, which I'll tell you about, which is how do we know what fraction of the, of the US workforce we should think of as, as looking like N-type workers, what fraction looks like Y, and who are these workers? Because they're very differentially exposed to stuff that the Fed does. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Uh, the, 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 there's kind of two challenges in this. So what are the two? The, challenge, the first challenge is the notion of N is very abstract. It's about activities that shift demand curves. The other problem is that most people do a little bit of both of these activities. And the third issue is that firms in the economy, they don't directly hire people into N and Y. What they do is they hire people into occupations. So the way we're going to do it is think of different occupations as being in different, in, in different proportions, contributing activities that look more like Y versus more like N. And the idea is we're going to exploit the model implication that I just showed you that those different types of occupations, depending on how intensive in N versus Y they are, are going to move differently when, uh, when the economy gets hit by a shock. The general idea is to think of it like the way you think about like demand function, like demand system estimation. You think about angle curves. When, a, when income goes up, you might think about how does consumption expenditure move across different goods. We're going to do the same thing with labor shares across occupations. When, when the whole labor share goes up, how, which occupations go up more than others in terms of W times L? That's the idea. What's the way that we're going to do it? Well, we've got two ongoing um, techniques. One, one we have results for, one we don't. One is to kind of just posit that the 2008 recession was an um, aggregate demand shock and use different cha differential changes across, say, different regions over the, um, over the recession and controlling for tr differential trends appropriately. And the other then is to explicitly use monetary shocks, uh, identify monetary shocks like I just showed you. And we have some results on that, and they kind of look very promising. I had a slide with kind of the different occupations. I've chosen not to show it, but that's, that's where we're going with that. Um, the basic idea, it's, it's kind of simple. Um, uh, I'm just going to tell you, what, rather than make you stare at equation, I'm going to tell you what the occupational shape framework is. The way that we think about this is that for, a firm, for the two sectors in the economy to produce these overhead and production services, they need to hire different combinations of occupations. And the extent that they need those occupations the different occupations tells us which occupations are more heavily used in one versus the other. And it turns out that you can, those, those two parameters are called eta n and eta y. 
you can identify what the what each, what the, the intensity of each occupation in those two different activities by looking at how the share of that occupation in the total labor share changes when the whole labor share changes, as long as it's in response to a markup shock. So it has to be in response to like a monetary shock. That's what we do. Okay, and then um, then then the, the next step then is to take these these measurements and embed them into a model of, of heterogeneity, a heterogeneous agent New Keynesian model. So let me kind of spend my last two minutes, I've got I think, four minutes telling you how that works. So what we do is we take a standard uh, Hank model, heterogeneous agent New Keynesian model. The one we use is a, a two-asset version of the model from, uh, from my work with Ben Mollinger and Luca Violante. But what we do is we change it so that instead of having one dimension of het uh, fundamental heterogeneity, like in standard heterogeneous agent models, which is overall labor productivity, we introduce heterogeneity in what I'll call occupations. So for now, occupations are something that are stamped to people's head. Obviously, in the agenda, we'll move forward to like a Roy model of where people can choose these things. But for now, it's just people have different occupations. And the thing is, what an occupation is, an occupation is a different weight on how important they are for production of overhead services, overhead services versus production services. And in this, the illustrative re results I'm about to show you, we've assumed that um, these two dimensions of heterogeneity are independent, but obviously part of what the, uh, the empirical agenda is to understand better what the relationship is between uh, where are the high productive productivity workers working. Are they casual introspection might make you think that maybe a lot of the high productivity workers are more concentrated maybe say in the Y sector, the, the production sector, the overhead sector. Um, Okay, so that's what we do, and I'm not going to tell you about the model. Let me just show you some, 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 some results. So I'm going to show you kind of two pictures, and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. So I've, what I've plotted here is some first quarter impulse responses to an expansionary monetary shock in a variety of economies. So on the x-axis here is not time. These are not impulse responses. X, on, on, on the x-axis here is a different economy. And what I've done is I've chosen economies that through the standard... Uh, moments that we would target the steady state of our models to, they look identical. So they have the same labor share, the same profit share. Okay? But what they differ in is how much of the labor is in these N workers versus those Y workers. So the standard New Keynesian model in all of these figures is the, the red line on the Y axis. It's that point right there. That's the one that, that in all of these ones. It's the red line on the Y axis. Now, my... Uh, analysis of the labor share suggested that we shouldn't be focusing on the red line. We should be focusing on the blue line because the blue line is the case where uh, theta n was equal to 1, where you get profits moving in the right direction. And you can see that here in these, in, in, when you look at how profits respond to a monetary shock, profits go up in the blue line, but they always go down in the, in the red line. This is what people throw all sorts of things into their models to try to get that to go the other way. But I mean, they just naturally go this way. And at the same time, markups are going to fall. It's kind of simple, why? Because profits, m profits here returns to fixed factors. They're not returns to, to markups. Um, output is still, aggregate output is still, um, oh, it's over here, is still, uh, is still expansionary. Okay, so we think this is a better description of the aggregate. It also opens up, um, we think, very exciting doors for thinking about the distributional effects of monetary policy. So here's an example. What I've plotted here is I'm, I'm focusing on the blue line, so the case which I like, which is when theta n equals 1. And the blue lines here, again, for different types of economies, where we have different shares of, the, of workers in different sectors, um, I've got the average response of output, or consumption, aggregate output, to a monetary shock. So it's expansionary. Two things that you should take away from here. One, the aggregate effect, whether you have a big effect or a small effect from this shock, depends on what the workers in this economy are doing. So if we think that maybe we're moving, the economy is moving towards a production structure that looks more like N and less like Y, I mean, I kind of think that, but I don't have evidence yet to suggest that, that's going to matter for the efficacy of monetary policy and other, the effect of the economy aggregate demand shock. So if, even if only all, all you care about is aggregates, this suggests you should care about um, whether workers are engaged in these two activities. The second thing I want you to notice is take any economy you like, any point, and you see that across the different occupations in my model, you see extremely potentially different effects on consumption. And it's not different effects on consumption because people have different marginal propensities to consume, although that's part of it. It's fundamentally because they have different effects on their labor income. 
So these are the Y-intensive occupations versus the N-intensive occupations. And it could be that some people gain, some people lose in response to a quote-unquote aggregate shock. Okay? As far as I'm aware, that's the first model I've ever seen that's been able to generate something like that. So that's where we're trying to get to. Um, and I'm out of time. I had some, some thoughts to wrap up, but I'll uh, stop at the red dot. I'll ask you about those in the okay. Q&A. Thanks. Yeah. This research is joint work with Mauricio Larik and Ulrike Steins, and we are all from the University of Bonn. I guess I don't have to explain much when I say we live in unequal times, with income and wealth inequality being at historical highs. The fact that income and wealth inequality are at historical highs has turned the causes and consequences of high and probably still rising inequality in one of the defining topics of our time. There's hardly any policy debate, as we see probably here, public debate, academic debate that gets around the topic of inequality. And if you look at the evidence that we have and maybe take a step back and ask what type of evidence do we actually have over the long run, so how did inequality evolve over the last decades, then this evidence is limited probably in at least two, two respects. The first one is we typically look at income concentration, wealth concentration at the very top of the distribution. So sometimes we talk about how much income goes to the top 10% of the income distribution, how much wealth to the top 10 of the wealth distribution. But much more often we talk about even much smaller groups, like the top 1% of the income distribution, the top 0.1% of the distribution, which means like we are talking about 1% of the population, and there's 99% other people in the population about whom we know relatively little and about whom we know relatively little in terms of how the inequality changed for them. One reason that we talk so little about them is that we di didn't have the data to, to do so. The second dimension where we have, I would argue, limited um, evidence on how things evolved is the joint distribution of income and wealth inequality. So typically, if we talk about trends in inequality, we talk about how did income inequality evolve over time. And then we take a new look at things and ask, how did wealth inequality evolve over time? But, and <clears throat> that came up in the, the uh, presentations before, if we think about our models of wealth inequality, how we try to structure our thoughts about what are the drivers of wealth inequality, it's typically about an income process, income dynamics, turning into, through some consumption saving decision, a wealth distribution. So now if you look at the joint evolution of income and wealth, I'm going to argue that this is going to be informative about the drivers of wealth inequality. Okay? And maybe what we are going to find tells us we want to rethink or like at least add some drivers to our models of wealth inequality to better understand where wealth inequality comes from and what shapes in the, uh, wealth inequality. So what's the contribution of our paper? So <clears throat> given that I emphasize already data limitations, the first thing that we do is we take the survey of consumer finance data. I expect many people here in the room have seen the data, maybe worked with the data, um, and it's probably the data that is the most widely known for studying income and wealth distribution in the United States. This data exists since 1983. And what we have done over the last, I guess by now it's almost three years, is we have added some data to that. And I guess some people in the room might know that, but fewer people actually out there know that. There's also historical survey of consumer finance data that actually goes back until more or less the, um, the end of the Second World War. And so we combine this data to generate a data set that let us study the financial situation of U.S. households from 1949 to 2016. And given that we have the SEF plus something else, we call this the SEF plus, okay? So in the next step, with this data, what we are going to do is we study the district, like changes in inequality for the bottom 90% of the population. So we have been very concerned about the top 1%, the top 0.1%. We 
but now we are going to shift the focus a little bit and look like at the vast majority of people and going to look at the bottom 99, uh, 90%, 99%, 99% and how um, things changed for them. And then what we are also going to do is we are going to explore the joint trends of income and wealth inequality over the last seven decades. And that's going to be interesting because we are going to observe some very diverging trends and then the question arises, where does this come from? So then if you start thinking about it, you're going to realize, well, there is asset prices that affect wealth. Okay, so what we are going to highlight is the importance of asset prices, but asset prices alone are not enough, but in combination with the portfolio composition, and that this is that this very systematically varies along the wealth distribution. Okay, so here just a summary of the key um, key results that I'm going to walk you through in my in my presentation. The first thing, if we want to talk about distributions, is to make sure that we get like the aggregates right, so that we are not missing part of income that accrues over time or part of wealth. Okay, so the first thing we want to make sure is that the microdata that we have studied to look at the distribution actually aligns with what we know from the, um, from the macro data. So we go to the national income and product accounts, we go to the flow of funds and make sure that if we aggregate the micro data that this is consistent with what we see in the macro economy. I don't have time to talk about this today, but it looks pretty good, okay? So then we use this data to look at um, how income and wealth inequality change over time. And what we are going to realize is they are very diverging trends. And the first striking observation is if we look at income inequality, we are going to see that income inequality was on the rise since uh, 97, um, 1971. So 1971 is going to be like the focal po point in much of the, of the um, analysis. And it was on the rise until 2007 and it's still on the rise. So there's nothing too much spectacular ha happening with income inequality since 1970 is just on the rise, okay? But if you compare to wealth inequality, that's very surprising. Because if you look at wealth inequality between 1970 and 2007, nothing is happening, okay? Wealth inequality in 1971 and in 2007 is more or less at the same level, okay? So then you're wondering, income inequality is on the rise, wealth inequality is not, what are the drivers behind that? And then the next striking observation is if you look at wealth inequality, there's an unprecedented rise in wealth inequality following 2007, okay? After 2007, we see a strong rise in wealth inequality that's not comparable to anything we have seen over such a short period of time over the past six decades. What we are then going to highlight to understand these facts, first of all, the divergence, and second of all, this strong rise in wealth inequality after 2007 is that the combination of portfolio differences along the wealth distribution that we are going to document and the asset price dynamics that we have seen over this period can reconcile these diverging, diverging trends. So if you want to put the paper in a nutshell, wealth dynamics over the last seven decades in the United States constitute a race between the stock market and the housing market. So now let me try to summarize three years of work in one slide, okay? So the modern survey of consumer finance was started in 1983. It's the most widely used data set to study income and wealth distribution in the United States. There is, historical, uh, there is an historical predecessor to this data that actually started in 1947, but the first two years are kind of incomplete, so we started in 1949. But the data so far has not been systematically coded. So and just to give you an idea on the right-hand side, I show you the code book, one page of the code book from 1950, okay? And now imagine there are hundreds of these pages and you have to go through them and look for all the variables that you're interested in, okay? So that's a lot of fun. Um, so we did this and extracted very detailed data on income, income subcomponents, assets, and debt. If I'm going to talk about income today, I'm always going to refer to total household income, including transfers, um, but before taxes. If I'm going to talk about wealth, it's always what I call the consolidated balance sheet. So it's all assets that a household has minus debt. 
What we don't have in there is social security wealth and um, is defined benefit plans. But that's just like the ba um, baseline definition as it's uh, used by the um, staff of the Survey of Consumer Finances. Well, and then there was a lot of work. It's like just one bullet point, but it, uh, it actually hides a lot of work because then we had to go through this data. And for example, in the 60s, sometimes the um, households were not asked about their bond holdings. So then we had to impute the bond holdings um, in, in some of the years. Then we made sure that if you compare the data to census data in terms of age composition, educational composition, race composition, home ownership rates, that we make sure that the um, survey data matches what we know from the census. And then finally, the modern survey of consumer finance has a very, very sophisticated um, approach to oversample rich households. There's the issue, people who are rich don't like to answer surveys, okay? They have much lower response rates, and the modern SEF takes very, uh, very much care of this with a very sophisticated sampling scheme. We try our very best with the historical data where this has not been done to come as close as possible to what has, done with, um, what has been done with the, with the modern um, data, and hopefully there's going to be an updated version of the, of the paper in, 10 days from now, where we are very, um, where we provide a lot of details on what we are going to do there, or what we did there. Um, okay, so that is uh, the data set that we are now going to use to study trends in income and wealth inequality in the United States. First, here is uh, just some snapshots, 1950, 71, 98, um, 2007 and 2016. And if you see here a number like 30.7, that means that in 1971, the top 10 of the um, dis income distribution um, received 30.3% uh, of all income, okay? The red number here is just um, in 2007, and you see there's this huge rise in income concentration at the top, okay? It's almost a 15 percentage point increase in the income share of the top 10 of the population. Well, these are income shares, they have to add up to 100. If it goes up for the top, someone else has to have a lower income share. If you have a little bit more time than we now have, you see that like here and here, it's more or less the same decline for the bottom 50 and the 50 to 90. But in relative terms, the largest decline is down here for the bottom 50. And you can further decompose the bottom 50 and the bottom 25 and 25 to 50. And you see all of them had large drops in their, in their income share. So that's, if you look at the bottom 90, you find that the group who lost the most in terms of income shares, at least relatively, were the bottom 50. Now, let's go to the right part of this table where we have the same numbers for wealth, okay? So now the number of like 70.7 here means that the top 10% of the wealth distribution owns 70.7% of all wealth in the United States. Now look from, two, uh, from 1971 to 2007. What you see is hardly anything. Okay? Wealth inequality did not change much. Okay? If you do a little bit of like, I call this like aggressive rounding, okay? then uh, this is 71 and this is 71 too. Okay? So wealth inequality, wealth concentration at the top did not change. The same is true if you look at them both uh, at the two bottom numbers. So let's look next at the period, the decade after the, the Great Recession, 2007 to 2016, boom. Wealth inequality is going through the roof. We see a six percentage point increase in wealth inequality in six years, okay? We see more movement in the wealth concentration at the top within 10 years than we saw before within six decades. Okay. So now this was still like in the tradition of first looking at income, then looking at wealth. Now I'm going to look at the joint evolution of income and wealth. And to do this, I'm going to sort all households along the wealth distribution, okay? And look at households in the bottom 50% of the wealth distribution, look at their income and look at their wealth and ask how did these things evolve um, over time. First look at income, okay? Now the presentation is a little bit different. We have the same group, bottom 50, 50 to 90, top 10. And it's all indexed to um, 1971. 
So you can interpret this as growth rates relative to 1971. Okay? So if you look, for example, at the, at the top line here, this is the top 10% of the wealth distribution. They doubled their income between 1971 and 2007. Okay? That is the two here. Okay? So now let's look at the bottom 50% of the wealth distribution. Well, that's pretty frustrating. Okay? There's nothing happening here. Okay? They had the same real income in 1971 that they have in 2007. And then in between, you have what I call the middle class of 50 to 90% of the population. They see some income growth, but not too much. Now it's, let's contrast this to um, how they have done with re respect to their wealth. Okay? Same picture, everything is uh, indexed to 1971. And what you see again is until 2007, and I should highlight this dashed line there is 2007. Well, there's some movement up and down, but overall, they evolved very much in lockstep. Okay? So look, for example, at the bottom, oh, sorry. Look, for example, here at the bottom, bottom 50. Okay? They doubled their wealth in a situation where they didn't have income growth. They have twice as much wealth in 2007, but the same income. Look at the middle class here. It's 2.5, so a 150% increase in their wealth holdings. Contrast this with a 30% increase in income. And furthermore, contrast their wealth growth with the top 10. Okay? The top 10 and the middle class saw the same wealth growth despite very different income de developments. Okay, there's another thing to realize here. Okay? First of all, we see income inequality is rising. Wealth inequality is hardly increasing in, until 2007. Then comes 2007. Boom. Wait. Boom. Um, <laughs> the bottom 50 is a collapse. They are back to start. They are below that 1970 level uh, with respect to their wealth. Okay? Then you have here the middle class. There's a small decline. They start to recover, but they are still not at the level of 2007. What about the top 10? Well. There's some decline, but overall they couldn't care less. Wealth, uh, wealth is, is growing. Okay? And this is exactly this picture of rising wealth inequality after 2007. Okay? There's another thing now, a final thing to note here. Look at the, the axis. Okay? So here we have a 150% increase. For them here at most we have a 100% increase. That means wealth grew much more than income which means, in consequence, that wealth-to-income ratios increased a lot. So most strikingly, you see this here for the bottom. There's no income growth, but uh, uh, they have twice as much wealth, so their wealth-to-income ratios double. Why am I saying this? If we now try to think a little bit more structurally about the drivers of wealth inequality, the wealth-to-income ratio is going to play a crucial role. Okay. Okay, so let me try to put a little bit more, more structure on this, but it's like digestible, okay? So there is um, wealth of household I in period T plus one, and this is wealth of the same household in T plus some capital income. So this is dividend and interest income, and there is what I call here capital gains. Where do these capital gains come from? Well. You have your wealth invested in different assets. You have a house, you have stocks, you have a saving account, okay? And these assets might have changing prices, okay? So the Q here just combines price changes. So this is for an asset J, the price changes over time, multiplied by the portfolio share. So this is just your portfolio. How much do you have in housing? How much do you have in stocks? And this is just the price changes. If you have a lot of stocks, you are very much affected by the stock market. If you have a, most of your wealth invested in housing, you are very much affected by changes in the housing market. Okay? So that tells you that portfolio allocation and asset prices potentially have an important role in shaping wealth growth over time. Now let me do some simple reformulations. Well, I should also mention, well, for your wealth, it's also important how much labor income you have and how much you consume. Okay, so now I do some simple reformulations. First, I define savings. Savings is 
your capital income, so interest and dividend income, labor income minus your consumption, so I refer to this as your total income, that one. I further reformulate this by defining a saving rate, which is just all the savings relative to your total income, then the wealth dynamics simplify to this um, equation. You have savings here and the capital gains here. And now I want to look at the wealth growth rate, and that looks then like this. Okay, so wealth growth is just this asset price component here that comes from the portfolio allocation and asset prices. And what's important about this is it multiplies your stock of wealth. So in the simplest case, you only have a house. House prices go down 50%, your wealth is down 50%. Okay? So it can potentially have large effects on wealth growth in the very short run. That's important if you want to understand um, quick changes in wealth inequality over time. The second component here is what I call active savings. So this is how much of the money that comes in you take and put into your bank account. So this active savings, and therefore I highlighted the wealth to income ratio before. Here it's like the savings, but it's divided by the wealth level, okay? So two things now to, to realize. First, that's the term where income goes in. So if we have income inequality affecting wealth inequality, then it goes through, through this term here. But it's divided by the wealth level. So if wealth to income ratios go up, so and we have seen that they did, this term here tends to zero. Okay? So the higher wealth to income ratios are, the less important is savings, is income, is income inequality um, for wealth inequality. So high wealth to income ratios mute the effect from rising income inequality on wealth inequality. Okay, but now what we're really interested in, this is still wealth levels, we want to know something about the wealth distribution, so now I look at the wealth shares, and this is some line of, of lines of simple algebra, you end up with this equation. So the omega now is the wealth share. So for example, the top 10 wealth share I showed you before, and this is just the growth rate of that. And the equation here is very simple. If your wealth grows more than the average, your wealth share goes up, if your wealth grows less than the average, your wealth share goes down, okay? So now what I want to look at is how important are these cues for changing the, the wealth share? And for that, what is important is I have to have portfolio differences along the wealth distribution. So what I want to do next is to look at the portfolios of these different households like bottom 50, 50 to 90, top 10, and look at how they are composed. This is it. So now there's a lot of interesting things. I want you to focus on the following things. Here, this light area here, I hope you can see this. This you can think of as housing. And this is mortgage debt. And this is the consolidated household balance sheet. So this is wealth. So these households have a lot of housing. And because assets are much higher than wealth, that means they are highly leveraged. Okay. This is always how I think about a hedge fund. Okay. You're very exposed to one asset and highly leveraged. If things go wrong, your wealth is going, uh, going to go down pretty much. So this is the bottom 50. Now let's look at the 50 to 90, and we are going to see a very similar picture. It's again a large uh, light gray area, so a lot of housing, and assets exceed wealth, and this is due to, due to leverage. Okay. Again. Households are exposed to the housing market and they have leverage on that. Okay, finally the top 10 and now the picture changes. Now there's a dark area. The dark area here is equity, is stocks and um, non-listed equity and it's much larger. They still have houses, okay, it's still a, a large share, but uh, it's much smaller compared to the other portfolio components and there's hardly any leverage. So what we show in the paper is that if you look at all stock holdings in the United States, these guys, the top 10, over all the time period that we are looking at, always hold more than 90% of all stocks in the United States. So stocks is really an asset of the rich, while for housing that's much more equally spread, and the bottom 50% are very much exposed to housing. To see this, this is just one number to, to highlight this, this is the elasticity of your wealth with respect to house price changes. 
Just to make an example, if this number here for the bottom fifth uh, of the 50 to 90 stands at 80, that means if house prices go up 1%, your, uh, your wealth goes up by 0.8%. Okay? So that's a pretty strong exposure to the housing market, in particular if you compare this to the top 10. Okay? That tells you 50 to 90 are very exposed to the housing market, top 10 are much less exposed to the housing market. If I did the same with stocks, it would just change. Okay, so that implies that if I have house price changes, that's good for the 50 to 90. If I have stock price changes, that's good for the top 10. Can I show this in the data? Let's see. So this is our measure of wealth inequality. That's the change, okay, so the change in the top 10 wealth share. And we regress this on changes in house prices and changes in the stock market. So if this is correct, what I just said, namely that house prices are good for the bottom uh, 90, then I should see the wealth share of the top 10 going down if house prices go up, and the wealth share of the top 10 should go up if, if the stock market goes up. So I should expect a, po a negative um, regression coefficient here and a positive one here. What do I find? Exactly what I thought, namely if housing, uh, the housing market goes up, the wealth share of the top 10 goes down. If the stock market goes up, um, uh, the wealth share of the top 10 goes up. Okay? This is what we refer then to as this race between the housing market and the stock market for wealth inequality. This is still like short run changes. Let's look at longer run changes. Look at this period from 1970 to 2007. Okay? And just ask how important were asset prices over this time period. And this is what I show you here. This is how much has wealth for the different groups grown just because the price has changed. Okay? No active saving, just price changes. You see for the bottom 50, they doubled their wealth, 100% okay? oh, growth just because of price changes. And if you look at the composition, it's mostly light gray, meaning it all comes from house, pr house price changes. Now let's look at the 50 to 90. You see 60%, so 60% wealth growth just because of price changes, and the top 10 more or less the same number. But what's important is the composition. For the top 10, it's mostly because the stock market um, rose over time. And all of this also implies that we have rising wealth to income ratios, meaning this mutes the effect of income inequality on wealth inequality. So that tells you already, Asset prices can drive up wealth of the households without them saving, so without them using any of their income. And income inequality also does not translate in wealth inequality because wealth to income ratios have gone up. Okay, now comes 2007 and the picture reverses. Bottom 50, large losses because the housing market collapsed. 50 to 90, uh, losses because the housing market collapsed. The top 10 also have some losses in the housing market, but that was overcompensated by the rising stock market that rebound very quickly after 2007. And this explains this increase in wealth inequality after 2007. Okay, so let's do in my last two minutes a very simple accounting exercise. So that's not sophisticated macroeconomic modeling, it's just a very simple accounting exercise. What would, happen, what would have happened in the United States with wealth inequality had house prices not increased? And we always look at the change in wealth shares for the bottom 50, 50 to 90, top 10. Just focus here on the top 10. This is the observed change between 1970 and 2007. Okay, so it's the 70.8 to whatever, 71.3 or so. And now if house price had stayed constant, wealth inequality would have gone up by a factor of five, okay? So we would have seen a four percentage point increase. By contrast, if it were stock prices that did not increase, wealth inequality would have been actually lower by 2007. Even after the financial crisis, we still see a mitigating effect of um, the house prices relative to a situation with constant house prices. We see a decline of wealth concentration by about a quarter. Okay. Wonderful situation to conclude. What are the conclusions? We provide microdata that we think offers a lot of other possibilities to study the situation of um, the financial situation of US households over the 
post-war period. Uh, we have uh, some things that we do in the paper if you're interested in. Um, what we document in terms of income and wealth inequality is diverging trends since the 1970s. And we highlight systematic portfolio differences in combination with asset price dynamics to reconcile diverging income inequality and wealth inequality trends. And these asset price dynamics are exactly something that currently most of our theory um, still, still misses. And if you want to have one take home message, wealth dynamics in the United States constitute a race between the stock market and the housing market. Thank you very much. So today I'm gonna to talk about market power, income inequality and financial instability. This is a joint work with, uh, with my colleague at the board, Jay Sim. And the usual disclaimer applies. So all the, all the results here are our own views. They do not represent the views of the research staff or other members of the Federal Reserve Board. There are five trends that motivate this paper that we've seen in the United States since 1980s and that we have already discussed quite a bit in this uh, panel. So first is a decline in the labor share together with the decline in the capital share. The second is the rise on the profit share, just the counterpart of the previous one. The third is this increase in income and wealth inequality, perhaps with different timings. And uh, the last two that I wanna bring today into the table is the rise of household leverage and the growing financial instability, which I'm thinking about an increase in the probability of default that is associated with this rise of household leverage. An example of that, so it's the Great Recession. So what we would like to do in this paper is to develop a theoretical model, and we'll start with an RBC model, that will have some features like imperfect competition, so we'll be able to talk about uh, profits. Uh, we'll have search and matching frictions, so we'll be able to talk also about bargaining power of workers and firms. We'll have two, uh, sorry, two agents, workers that will be main, the, the, mainly the borrowers, and shareholders that will be the creditors. And there's gonna be an endogenous financial crisis. And what we want to see with this model is whether with, there is a single cause, we will be focusing on this increase in market power, both in products and labor market, and see how far we can go with just this change in explaining those uh, five trends that I just mentioned. And the results will be that this uh, model can go uh, quite, quite long and can help us understand quite a bit of all these five trends in, together. And then when we have this uh, model understood, then we will try to uh, understand how redistribution policies may have uh, macroprudential effects. And we'll, I will finally uh, talk about the contribution of the disinflation policy that the United States experienced in the last 30 years. Whether it has contributed or not towards that trend, how to think about that. And we'll find that under certain circumstances, not uh, all of them, there's gonna be a trade-off between financial stability and price stability. Okay, so that's a bit of a, my roadmap today. So I'll not do any empirical work today, so I'll just rely on other people's work about the evidence that we've seen an increase in market power. So there's been a large recent literature that uh, documents both increases in market power in product markets, uh, like uh, they document steady increases in concentration measures over the last few decades. They, there are papers that compute measures of markups directly and document how much they have increased over time, but also on uh, the fact that the, the market power of firms in the labor market has also increased. So we can see that in the decline in unions and collective bargaining uh, agreements, uh, and there is also some research done about uh, looking at local labor markets and documenting the high, the high concentration that there is in those markets, and then maybe associated with lower wages. The contribution to the literature of this paper is the following. So on the one hand, we have uh, you know, very good papers that bring, that explain us the consequence of this rising market power in terms of declining labor share and declining capital share. But these papers do not study the links among those changes in profits and, and labor shares into the income uh, distribution or wealth distribution and into explaining financial imbalances. On the other hand, there is a, a prominent paper by Kumo et al. that they link uh, changes in the income distribution with changes in leverage and increasing the probability of default. But in this paper, um, the, the authors uh, take the changes in income distribution as exogenous. So what we would like to, be, uh, to do in this paper is to bring these two literatures together and try to see whether this only single cause in changes in 
you know, structural changes in product and labor markets, whether they can also be behind this income and wealth inequality, and whether this you know, also explains the uh, rise in leverage and the associated increase in the probability of default. Today I'm going to present a model, and here's an overview of the model that I'll present. So we'll start with an RBC model, there's going to be two agents. So we'll take very much the framework of Como et al, and we'll endogenize the production. So we'll have mono, uh, monopolistic competitive firms and certain matching predictions in the labor market, so we can also say something about the unemployment rate. To implement this rise in market power, we'll assume a decline in the elasticity of substitution among these differentiated groups, and we'll also assume a decline in workers' bargaining power. So the, that framework allows us to play with these two parameters and, and see the implications of both. There are going to be two agents in the model, uh, agent W, the worker, um, which will be the borrower, this represents in reality the 95% of the uh, income earners, the bottom 95% income earners. They'll have standard preference, they will work and they'll receive a wage or they will be unemployed searching for a job receiving unemployment benefits. And they'll issue bonds to smooth consumption. Then they will have another type of agent, the agent K, which is the shareholder, the creditor, this is the top 5% which I don't you know, view that uh, with respect to the reality. And importantly, they'll have wealth entering the utility function. So we'll, they will not only draw utility from consumption, but also from accumulating wealth. And that's going to be a key mechanism in the move. So an endogenous financial crisis will occur, and I will describe this, this a bit more in detail as I move along. And uh, in what is a financial crisis is when a situation where all borrowers default partially on their debt. So I'll start with the firms because this part is completely standard and we already see actually some of it uh, with uh, Professor Kaplan's presentation. So we'll have a um, continuum of monopolistic uh, competitive firms. Each firm will be subject to a downward sloping demand curve and this gamma here is the elasticity of substitution with the one that will be, you know, one of our parameters that will be uh, playing with in, the, in our exercise. And these firms maximize profits subject to this demand and the standard uh, market pricing rule, as we saw in a couple of presentations before, is that they will set a price equal to a markup over the marginal cost. Okay? And in a symmetric equilibrium, when all firms can set, you know, there are flexible prices here, they will always uh, choose a, a, marginal, a real marginal cost, that is the inverse. Uh, the real marginal cost will turn to be the inverse of the markup. Okay? So from this slide, what I want to take away from here is that in this very simple framework, there is a very tight link between the markup and real marginal cost. And this is what is going to be one of the key mechanisms in the, in the results. Then there's going to be um, uh, firms producing using capital and labor. So they'll have to satisfy this demand. So they'll produce uh, with the Cobb-Douglas production function. And to hire labor, they'll have to you know, uh, post vacancies because there are frictions in the labor market. And this is the, the V out there. Uh, so the employment evolution is that if you don't get the job destroyed, you will have the same, you know, one minus row employment of yesterday, and then new employment that is given by the vacancies that get filled. From here, we can derive the standard factor efficiency condition. So the returns on capital and the vacancy posting condition, which just equalizes the cost and benefits of getting an additional vacancy filled. So how is the wage determined? It's a standard in um, search and matching models is by, by Nash bargaining. So ETA here will uh, represent the workers' bargaining power, and they will choose the weight that maximizes the, the Nash product. Okay? Um, so the takeaway point from this slide, if you want, is that there's going to be a very tight relationship between the factor shares, so both the wage and the returns to capital, with respect to the real marginal cost, which I already said that the real marginal cost will be completely linked to the, to the market. So let me now describe the two agents. So I'll start with the agent, the worker, which is the most standard uh, agent in the model. So this agent has a standard preference, and there is going to be one minus chi uh, population share of those agents. So chi is the 5%, so one minus chi is the 95%. So they maximize utility subject to the budget constraint, and I'll be a bit more specific about the budget constraint here. So what is the income? Uh, which is going to be a relevant variable for my analysis. The income is, of, is the, the wage income and also the um, unemployment benefits if they are not employed. They have to pay some lump sum taxes that, because we need to balance the budget of the government. And then they can um, smooth consumption 
by using uh, one single in, uh, financial instrument, with the, which is a defaultable discount bond. So let me be a bit more uh, careful here. So B is the amount of this uh, private bond that they can issue, and QTB is the price of that bond. So this bond gives you a return. Uh, they need to, um, today they get pay QTB, and tomorrow they need to return one unit if they don't default. If they default, they only need to return part of it, one minus H. H is a haircut, okay? So default has a benefit. You release uh, some debt burden. But it has a cost in the model, and this is taken from the work of Kumo et al. paper. The cost is that their income will be persistently lower. And this is the pecuniary cost of default. So if you default, and this is the, the delta V here is just an indicator on function of whether you do default or not, there's going to be you know, a, a fall in gamma uh, new of, uh, of income that will persist for several periods, and the persistence will, will be governed by this uh, raw parameter. Um, then the worker will optimally decide whether to default or not, balancing this cost. And as I will describe next, it's going to be also a, an utility cost of default, apart from this pecuniary cost of default. Oh, sorry, I miss. I move one. So let me now uh, describe the preference for Agent K. So Agent K will have um, preference for wealth. So this parameter here will be the weight on the wealth on, on, in the utility function. So if we set this to zero, then this agent is, uh, in terms of preference, is the standard one. But this parameter will be different, uh, positive and different from zero. So um, what is the income of this uh, um, uh, agent, K? So it's going to be the profits of this monopolistically competitive firm because they own the firms. And it's going to be also the return on capital. Okay? And there's going to be this part of debt. Of course, they will not receive the full amount that they gave to the worker if there is default, only one minus H of that. So what is important here at the end of the day is that their income will be you know, fully determined by the profits and this capital income. On the worker side, what matters the most is what's going on uh, with the labor, labor income. So from here, we can derive the credit demand and supply in this economy. So credit demand will be given by the first of the condition from the worker's problem. And it's a standard one that will equalize the gains and benefits of having an extra unit of uh, of uh, credit. So the cost is that, okay, if I get another unit of credit today, I lose my, my utility today of consuming, but tomorrow I can consume that unit and I gain that and I'll put this together. From the credit supply side, so the, the EGNK does not get benefits only for consuming tomorrow, but it also gets the benefit today of increasing the utility because accumulating wealth enters directly into the utility function. So there is the, this extra term that is perhaps less conventional. Okay. So let me just finalize how the endogenous financial crisis is determined. So here it's endogenous because the worker will be comparing the cost and benefits of defaulting. And it will be trading on what is the cost, um, not only in terms of this output loss that I have described, income loss that I have described, but also in terms of the uh, utility cost of default. And what helps with this utility cost of default is that at the end of the day, the crisis is a random uh, event. Okay, that is, if you accumulate more debt, you may uh, phase of financial crisis, but there is no certainty that that will happen, and this utility cost helps uh, because of that. So, sure. Workers are all the same here? Yes, there is uh, across each class, there is no differences. So here we don't have heterogeneous workers and heterogeneous labor income. But they're employment group, they're all unemployed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a representative agent, let's say. So um, let me say here. The model is calibrated to match these key moments of the U.S. economy in early 1980. So I'll not describe in detail what's the, what's the, you know, the calibration of all the parameters of the model. But the idea here is that we'll calibrate the model at the beginning of the 1980s to match these moments that I describe here. For example, the default parameters are going to be very related to Kumov et al. There's going to be a mean probability of financial crisis close to the empirical counterpart in the early 1980s. Will match the drop of uh, um, the, the financial crisis will imply a five percent output drop on impact, which is about two point five percentage points increase in the unemployment rate. Uh, household leverage, uh, income shares, and labor income share is all matched to uh, to the nineteen eighties moments. And from here, what we are going to change, and this is uh, we are explaining here secular trends. So I'm not studying these cycle implications today. So we are going to change two parameters and see how, how much the, you know, what are the impl macroeconomic implications. 
So we are going to change, and these are the exogenous shocks, we are going to increase the market power of firms in the product market by changing the elasticity of substitution. And it's going to be a random walk process, so there's going to be these sh uh, shocks, epsilon, that will affect uh, the markup of firms. And we'll choose the process to match what the data is, uh, is telling us about the increase in the markups in the data. And then we'll increase also the market power of firms in the labor market. So we'll be decreasing the workers' bargaining power according to this uh, random work process. And important, and this is to match the, the decline in the unemployment rate from 1980s to today's. And importantly, the agents don't, uh, have for, uh, do not have perfect foresight of these shocks. So basically, every period, the agents in the model will be surprised about these permanent changes in the income distribution. Okay? So these are just the, the shocks that we are imposing. So the markup will move from around 118 to around uh, 140. This is a bit less than what we observe in the data, just to be a bit more conservative as well. And here is the change that we match from 12% to around 6% uh, unemployment rate at the beginning and end. And the rest, we don't touch anything else in the model, and we just see what are the implications of that. And here are the main results of the paper. So the first line here, you perhaps you are not surprised if you are familiar with the work of Barkai. So in that paper, um, uh, Barkai shows that a decline in the markup and a decline, uh, will bring, of course, an increase in the, sorry, an increase in the profit share. And uh, consequent, con consequently, that will bring a decline in the labor share and in the capital share. So this is the, the changes in the shares that have been already documented as a consequences of this increase in markup. What our framework brings like, uh, together with that is that these changes in the factor shares, this increase in the profit share, will be an increase in income from the agent K, which is the top five, and the, decline, the labor share decline will imply a decline in income of the bottom 95. And this will imply an increase in income inequality. And because uh, when this agent K, the top 5%, observe this increase in income has, you know, it will consume more, but it will also save more, it will accumulate more wealth because this gives him utility, this uh, agent K will, you know, accumulate debt, they will be willing to, to lend more and uh, workers will be willing to borrow more because they are facing this decline in income and they want to keep up with their consumption. And this increase in debt will be associated with a an increase in the probability of default. Okay. If we compare these trends with the data, uh, some of them, um, what we can see is that the model can do, uh, I mean, I'm not being, <laughs> trying to be very quantitative here, but in terms of at least the direction and the magnitudes a little bit, is that the model can go a long way in explaining uh, these trends in the data. So the model will be able to explain by definition, because I, I target the shocks like that for the unemployment rate, but uh, untargeted are the, the labor share decline, uh, similar to the amount that we see in the data, the increase in the private credit, uh, I might mention here that is household leverage credit, household leverage over GDP, this increase in income inequality and the associated increase in the probability of default. So we don't have these, uh, these small moments these in the data because here we are focusing more trends, so one could plot even from the data just the trend and not just the, all the data. And associated with that, it's going to be that because this agent will, uh, you know, because of the increase in profits that we observe, and the result, because of this resulting increase in income inequality, if you compute the net present value of these profits divided by GDP, this will also line up with this increase in market capitalization that we've seen in the United States. So how much, um, so how much now it's one shock versus the other. So, so far I've put these two shocks together, markup shocks and uh, shocks to the workers' bargaining power. So in this slide, I'm trying to disentangle the importance of each shock. So in blue is the same baseline results that I presented so far with both shocks. And in red, I only have shocks to the markup, to this elasticity of substitution, okay? And what we can see here is that most of these trends are driven by these changes in the markups. So this increase in market power of firms in the product market can go a long, a, a long way in explaining those trends. Um, the, the decline in workers' bargaining power has nothing to say perhaps about the decline in the capital share, sorry, the capital share, but can say something about that, you know, this delta, this difference here can say something about the, the decline in the labor share, uh, 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 an increase in the profit share. It goes in the right direction for all, but perhaps quantitatively, the, the change in the, the increase in market power uh, through the lens of this model may be the most uh, prevalent feature. Why is the, 
bargaining power shock important is for the evolution of unemployment. So if you look at the unemployment rate here, if I only had shocks to the market power, I'm producing less in this economy, uh, profits are higher, the unemployment rate will increase, so I'm using less labor. But that's a counterfactual um, uh, result because we, don't, we have not seen at least an increase in the natural rate of unemployment. We've seen, if something, a decline. So there is one thing why the bargaining uh, shock is crucially here is to generate you know, a decline in the, uh, in the unemployment rate over that period. And this is just a summary of what I just said. So in the minutes, in the 10 minutes that I have, I'll discuss a bit of um, policy implications. And one is uh, thinking about what can we do about these trends? Is there anything that uh, we can do to prevent this buildup in, in credit and this increase in the associated um, financial instability? So this is just an uh, illustration, so please don't take this as a policy prescription. But what we'd like to see is here is what would happen in this economy if we introduce a dividend, dividend tax. Okay, So we are going to tax dividends uh, with Tau, and the tax rate will gradually, we just make an exercise here, is we gradually increase this tax rate over these 30 year periods from 0 to 30%. And the revenues that we take from the profits are, take, are given to Agent W as social security benefits. Um, and agents, again, these shocks will be you know, unanticipated by the agents. So what's going to happen is that because this, this dividend tax does not um, influence production, the first three trends will be untouched. This dividend tax has, you know, it doesn't affect, it doesn't distort uh, the allocation of um, production factors. Uh, what it affects this dividend tax is how these changes in the factor shares will translate in into changes in the income inequality. Because this increase in the profit share will, will be uh, tax, um, the income of the top 5% agent will increase by less. And because of this, these proceeds will go to agent W as social security benefits, the declining income of the bottom 95 will be less. So the overall increase in income inequality will be less aggressive in that uh, setup. And of course, if there is a lower increase in income inequality, these agents will accumulate less, less, less debt, so they less wealth, so they will be you know, willing to, to, to lend less, and, and also wor workers will be willing to borrow less. And the increase in um, household uh, credit will be much lower, and the, and the associated, of course, probability of default increase will be also much lower. So what we take from here is that um, a dividend tax, in this, this is just an example, but one could think about a dividend tax as a macroprudential uh, policy because it may have effects on the amount of uh, financial imbalances in the economy. So, so far I said nothing about um, nominal rigidity, so this is something I'm going to turn next. Um, be, uh, before that, ju just let me say that we try uh, several robustness checks along different dimensions, and I don't have the time to go to all of them today, but if you are interested, I would be more than happy to discuss them later on. So we have tried different alternative information structure, think about the shocks that are fully anticipated by the agents instead of just surprises, as we have assumed in the baseline. Um, we have also considered the case where capital enters the utility function, not only financial wealth, and we have also explored the role of uh, preference, this keeping up with the Jones's preferences, where uh, uh, agents, the bottom 95, age, uh, 95 agents, have preference over, you know, the average consumer, average consumption, and they will try as their incomes, you know, doesn't increase that much. They want to keep up with this average consumer, uh, but overall the results seem robust to all these different specifications. So, because of the of the interest on the conference on nominal uh, rigidities, let me turn now to um, some new results on that. So, so far we've talked about RBC economy, baseline economy with flexible wages, flexible uh, prices, sorry. And we are thinking here, is any of the results affected by nominal rigidities? So we were mostly concerned that this same period of these trends that I've uh, talked about in my first slide have been happening at the same time that we've seen the disinflation policy uh, going on. So we've seen the inflation rate falling from almost two digits at the end of the, of the 80s to below 2% uh, recently. And we'll be thinking about, can, can this disinflation policy have some independent contribution to those trends, or is completely you know, unrelated to those trends? So this is the type of questions we want to uh, ask. 
Um, so we will be thinking about a central bank that has perfect control of the inflation target. Okay, so the central bank controls perfectly that and decides over this 30 year period to bring down the inflation rate from 8% to 1.6%. This is just the trend if I take um, the beginning of the 80s and the end of, of um, 2007. Um, and we'll be thinking about two types of uh, price uh, setting models. So two price of sticky price model. The first one is the standard one where we have the Campbell frame, framework where we have this targeted pricing with exogenous contract duration. So basically the frequency of price adjustment is fixed. So the, regardless of the inflation rate, you always have a probability phi to adjust your prices. But we'll be in contrast, we'll, put, uh, we'll be thinking about the model and we take the model by Levin and Yun where the probability of price adjustment is endogenous in the sense that uh, depending on how inflation is, firm, uh, firms will choose a different uh, probability of reset the prices. Okay? And we'll see that these two models will have very different implications uh, for the results. So let me just uh, bring here the equation of, which is going to be the main one to understand these differences. This is the equation mu, uh, just recall, is the real marginal cost. Okay? So this equation is from Levin and Yun, and um, it's very handy for, for explaining the results. So real marginal cost, which is again the main driving force for all these trends in the model, now will be related to this, uh, with no, so without nominal rigidity, sorry, without nominal rigidity, we didn't have these two terms. We just had that the real marginal cost was related to the markup um, through this elasticity of substitution. Now with, with uh, inflation being different than zero, uh, we have these extra terms here. So inflation will be affecting the real marginal cost, but also this phi here. This phi here is this frequency of price adjustment. Let's think first about the exogenous contract duration. This phi is fixed. So every period there is a constant fraction of firms that change the, the price regardless of the inflation rate. So regardless of the, my inflation target, the probability of price adjustment is the frequency is always the same. The slope of the Phillips curve is always the same. So then how can I achieve all this decline in the inflation target? The central bank will achieve that by lowering uh, the, the real marginal cost. So basically, when you move from an inflation rate of 8% to 2%, the co the, the, the efficient, there is a gain in efficiency because of inflation rates of, of 10%. What happens is that, and firms don't have the, the probability, the, the, they cannot adjust their frequency of price adjustment. What happens is that as time goes by, your price is, if you cannot reset, is farther and farther away from the optimal price. And this creates distortions in the economy because price, relative prices do not reflect you know, real marginal cost anymore. So in this economy, there's going to be a, a huge uh, efficiency loss just because of the presence of non-zero inflation. So as you bring the inflation target down, you lower that efficiency, uh, efficiency cost, and thus this will imply a reduction in the real marginal cost. And this will be sum to the reduction in marginal cost that already these changes in, in, the, in market power was, was bringing. Okay? While in the, endo in the endogenous contract duration model, when inflation is high, it's very costly for the firms to be away from the optimal price. So if, the, if you give the firms an opportunity to decide the frequency of price adjustment, they will decide to have a higher probability of, of adjusting the, the price. And as you lo lower the inflation target, that probability will be lower, and the slope of the Phillips curve will lower. So in that environment, uh, this disinflation policy occurs through changes in the slope of the Phillips curve that has no implication on real marginal cost. Okay? And from that picture, we can already see the difference in results that that would bring. So these are the changes over these 30 year periods in my baseline economy. And these are the changes that I observe in the endogenous contract duration and in the exogenous contract duration. Let me start with the endogenous contract because as I show, there is no further change in marginal cost, which is in the end the ultimate source of changes in factor shares and thus income inequality. So in this economy, I'll have exactly the same results as in RBC uh, model. This inflation didn't bring anything uh, on top of you know, the other trends. But that conclusion would be different if we think about the world where firms cannot adjust their prices. In that world, there's going to be a further decline in real marginal cost coming from these gains in efficiency. This will imply a further increase in markup on top of what the other trends were bringing. 
and that will imply you know, higher declines in the labor share, capital share, increase, much greater increases in the profit share, income inequality, private credit to GDP, and probability of default than my baseline RBC economy. Okay? So this is just a summary of what I said. And in my 30 seconds, let me just conclude. So in this paper, we've shown that the increase in market power, both in the product and the labor markets, who have generated a few macro trends, rising profit and falling uh, labor share, rising income inequality and growing financial instability, and that the results are robust across a few dimensions. Uh, we've shown that redistribution policies can have some macroprudential policy effects. And then our, our analysis on the role of nominal rigidities indicates that this inflation may have contributed to this increase in income inequality and financial imbalances only if a non-trivial fraction of firms follow these dependent time um, pricing strategies. In that case, there might be a trade-off between financial stability and price stability. However, even in endogenous contract duration model, there would be no trade-off and no additional contribution to the trends. So I was going to start just with um, one question that I was going to pose to both of our theory presenters, and then one question I was going to propose to both of our uh, more, more data-heavy presenters. Um, so I think I'll start in with the theory question. And, and Greg, I'll put you on the hot seat first so Isabel has a second to reflect <laughs> after talking. So just for the benefit of our broader audience, I just, I'll reiterate uh, what a lot of us uh, routinely think about which is the reason that we build these mathematical models. Why do we build these mathematical models of the economy? They require these simplifications and abstractions. Um, and, and yet, even though they're simplified and abstract, they seem very complicated. So why do we do this? We do this so that we have a way to make a very informed and educated guess about what we should do um, in different policy situations. So I wanted just both of you to kind of weigh in um, and provide, if you can, an example of a policy decision um, that you think would be different in light of your model. Um, and then maybe as, as a follow-up, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to um, what you would pull out as the similarities and the differences between the models you, the two of you each presented. They have, they have some similarities and some differences, and I'm kind of wondering. Um, where you would point to using one versus the other for decision making. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So um, I think we need to take a step back and think a little bit what the role is of these models in, in the policy process. So um, I don't necessarily see success of um, quantitative macro modeling as I'm going to show you a model, I'm going to simulate something from my model, I'm either going to predict the future better or convince you that yeah. you should have done something, you should have done something differently. Um, sometimes that's the case. Yeah. I think we learned a lot about in um, the bigger picture. I mean, we, we can think of a lot of examples in how we conduct monetary policy at a more general level, how we design central banks, how we think about rules that came from insights from theory. From a, on a day-to-day -day level, I don't see that the, as the primary goal of, um, of like the sort of work I'm doing, although I think it's useful for that. So what is, what is the goal then? I think it's, um, so the way I see it is, is, is like this, is that, um, I think it's very easy to come up with economic mechanisms to describe uh, lots of different uh, outcomes that we observe. Okay, so we know that even for the most sim simplest types of economic decisions, um, you can tell stories about why coherent economic thinking would lead you to think that something goes in one direction versus the other. So the, the example I like to give is that when your wage goes up, should you work more or work less? Uh, I can tell the story about the income effect. I can tell the story about the substitution effect. They both sound right. Um, and when we're thinking about macroeconomic questions, I think there's all sorts of factors and forces that are um, affecting the, the impacts of policy. Monetary policy is a perfect example of that. There's lots of different transmission mechanisms and lots of different uh, potential ways in which they might affect different types of people. I see the role of these models as helping us to figure out if, if for a given, um, for a given uh, policy decision which of those forces at any given point in time might be the ones that are most quantitatively relevant. And, uh, and I think we've, we've learned some things by thinking about this class of heterogeneous agent models more, more generally. Um, but it comes not just on the models alone, it comes by thinking about the models, within, thinking about data within the context of these models and using the, the uh, restrictions implied by the data we observe to help bound some of, the, some of these different forces. Um, so, so what is my hope? My hope is that by understanding, uh, having theories that, uh, that can allow us to 
um, think about the relative strengths of different mechanisms. When we're when policymakers are sitting around the table thinking about how to weigh up different how to how to weigh up um, the relative uh, strength of different forces they might be considering, some of the insights from the sort of work that, that we're doing will help them to think about maybe we should pay more attention to, for example, the the wealth effect on consumption and less to the intertemporal substitution effect. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. okay. Isabel, do you want to add on? Yeah, perhaps I'll just say that um, as the way I think about the models is just it gives me a framework on how to think about um, reality. And um, it makes me be very rigorous about the, um, the effect that I'm trying to capture and try to say, you know, really, I'm, 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 I care about that in the reality. Let me see how this would work through the model, how different parameters would affect that, what I'm, I'm looking for. And um, also to really quantify as well this mechanism that I think is prevalent. But I also something that I, I, I learn a lot from working, you know, policy at the board mm -hmm. is that you can never, never rely on a unique model. That would, you know, because there is no model that can be comprehensive of everything that is going on in reality. So all the models have simplifications, limitations, and we should be all aware of that. So I think the best approach here is that if you have a policy question in mind, is try to find the best model that approaches that and, and then be careful about the implications so, or adopt a multi-model approach. So just think about different model, different implications are a way that um, put this together with a lot of judgment and, all, and, and talk about people that really look at the data and spend hours and hours trying to understand the data. And when you put all this together in a room, then perhaps that's the point where you can start making a policy decision. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna now turn it over to our, our data folks and I wanna give lots of opportunity for <coughs> other folks to ask questions. Um, so I was struck, I think, in both your paper, Fatsi, and your paper, Moritz, is by you know, what to me are fairly surprising facts. Um, I think that they probably are somewhat surprising to um, folks in the audience as well and, and to the general public. So I'm wondering, and this is almost a softball for you, Fatsi, but um, if you could just kind of highlight, do you think that anything that you've documented speaks to any misconceptions um, that either policy folks or the general public have about the distribution of wealth or well-being. So what are those misconceptions that are out there that I think your work um, is speaking to or combating? And then also, what's the next step? Um, is there a policy implication coming out of the data that you've documented directly, or are we not there yet, and there are other data questions that we need to ask? So about income uncertainty, um, during my talk, I just you know <clears throat> made a reference. Uh, in the past 20 years, I would say, you know, this was viewed as such a consensus view that um, there is maybe too many to count. You know, like the trends, the U.S. economy in many ways has gone through this you know um, very stark transition in many ways since the 1970s, uh, and the rise of inequality is one. The stagnation of labor productivity is another one. The labor share very related but many others like this. And a lot of these actually uh, uh, were explained, or one of the ingredients were, was uh, the, the rise of income uh, uncertainty. So in a way, I think a lot of these explanations we have to kind of rethink. And um, <clears throat> so to me, I mean, um, rather than giving just one example, I'll put it more broadly like this, that the paper I, for example, cited by Lindquist and Sargent is trying to explain the uh, different experiences of US and Europe in terms of unemployment. And uh, the punchline of that paper is that the unemployment rate in Europe was lower before the 1970s compared to the US. And uh, during the 70s, it jumped up um, together with the US, but then it stayed high. And that has been somewhat of a puzzle. And their explanation is that you know, the turbulence during this period has increased. And they take, you know, the fact, actually they, they explicitly cite Moftan Gottschalk and a lot of the paper is about kind of fitting into that framework. Now, if volatile, volatility and uncertainty hasn't increased, then how do we now go back and explain the same pattern, you know? 
um, some maybe ideas, some hypotheses that we had that we discarded. Maybe we have to get them back out of the you know a closet and take a look at them. And maybe uh, uh, and actually just let me let me mention uh, one thing. The way I started working on this paper goes back many many years, and it's in 2010. I was at a conference in Shanghai, and Steve Davis, um, you know the economist at the University of Chicago, was discussing a paper by uh, several economists. And um, the model was working very well in explaining some patterns in the data until you introduced income uncertainty that rose over time. So the writers of the paper were trying to change the model, actually, to say, OK, we know that happened. If that happened, our model doesn't work. What can we do? And Steve Davis actually cited one of the first papers, a CBO report in 2007, that actually said, well, volatility doesn't seem to go up. And he said, maybe you don't need to change anything in your model. Just don't add income uncertainty going up. So I think there's a lot uh, of those out there. Um, but I don't want to jump and say that there's less income risk. Mm -hmm. Volatility is one aspect of income risk. And uh, another one, for example, is in technical terms, the skewness of income shocks, which is you know, when you fall down, how far do you fall down? Because you can have a distribution in which um, the overall dispersion is the same, but it is skewed to the low end. When you fall, you fall a lot, but when you, your wages increase, they don't increase by the same magnitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Morris, did you have, what do you think comes out of your paper that's a, a surprise that we should take away? So, <clears throat> well, I, I think one thing that I found like the most surprising also to me is like really this power that asset prices have in shifting the, the wealth mm -hmm. distribution. So I think in terms of policy, like almost that's maybe more like fiscal policy or regulation. I think there's a lot of policies that like does something about quantities, but had also direct implications for prices. So if we think about housing policy, stock market regulation and so on, I think it's always worth thinking about um, what potentially is going to happen to prices and also what are the distribution and consequence of this? Like who holds the assets? And I think there's also an important like intergenerational aspect to it because these assets might be held by different generations and different generations might have purchased the asset at different points in time. And if we now implement a new policy and that changes prices, that might have huge intergenerational yeah. um, this um, distributional consequence. And I think the other thing is also, like, that didn't, well, I didn't talk about this much, but asset prices also have the, the power to, like, uh, reduce wealth inequality. So there was this yeah. period in the 70s, but I, I'm not sure we want to have this period back when stock markets declined, but that was a period where wealth inequality really contracted uh, quite, quite substantially. And well, there might be other policies that maybe foster house prices or other assets that are held by the bottom 90 that can do something um, for, like, if we're interested in reducing wealth inequality, that can do something about this. So I think these asset prices that we so far, even in our models, typically did not consider too much um, are probably very important to take into account when we make policy decisions. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, Neil, and then we also have folks coming around with microphones. So we'll, we'll start off, um, President Kashkari, and then other folks who have questions should just put up your hands and find one of our microphone folks. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, everybody, for the great presentations. So, Moritz, on the point you were just making, uh, a lot of times people will say to me, hey, look, Fed, you had these low rates after the Great Recession. You had this QE. You just ballooned wealth inequality. What have you accomplished? And my, I have a two-part response, and I would welcome your response to my response. Mm -hmm. uh, first part of my response is for most, for many Americans, their most valuable asset, they may not own a house, their most valuable asset is their job. And if you capitalize their earnings, that's actually a very important asset in their life, maybe their most important uh, financial asset. And by keeping rates low, we are ultimately trying to boost wages, and that will ultimately boost the value of their asset. And I'm... I just appreciate your response to that. And you know, if you look in recent years, wage growth has now started ticking up finally. And fastest growth is for lowest income 
earners. So that's at least consistent with my story. And then second, I always ask, well, what's the counterfactual? How could tighter monetary policy possibly have affected those families that we are all saying that we are you know, trying to advocate for? And so I just welcome your response to both of those. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think I completely agree. I, I think the, the fact that human capital is really like the most important asset on the household balance sheet, although we don't put it there, is, um, is very important. And I think that's, it's, that's, as you said, very important to, to think about how can we maybe affect the value of, the, uh, of human capital in terms of job stability and so on. And these job stabilities might be very different along the, uh, along the employment distribution. Um, and it's, it's not like we didn't talk about welfare here. So it's not clear how to think about um, increasing wealth inequality or not. Like if, if I live in a house and I have a house and the price of the house changes, that's fine. But if I'm never going to move out of the house, I couldn't care less. So um, I, I think it's, it's something that we should keep in mind that we should think about that if people need the money, then it's, or like if people want to move, if want to, and there I think it, it ties to human capital. Like if I'm in a house that just lost, a lot, like lost all my lifetime savings and now I want to move, if this is like important and prevents me from moving, although I'm kind of skeptical that this is the case, then it might be an important decision. Or if it comes to, can I send my kid uh, to college? If like financial constraints are important, then changes in wealth inequality are important, and if, financial inequality translates into opportunities and opportunities to accumulate human capital, then it's important also, I think, to, to think about asset price. But otherwise, I, I completely agree. I think there might be an additional dimension to that. Hi, Parna Mathur, AEI. Uh, so th there's been a you know an excellent discussion about sort of explaining income inequality and, and wealth inequality. But at a very fundamental level, I think a lot of the debate is really about measuring an income inequality as well. So you know we had Piketty and Sayers saying that the top one percent, their income shares have ballooned over time, and you know look at the massive changes in inequality as a result of that. But we also had a recent report from Treasury and JCT economists saying, well, if you allocate you know, corporate incomes better and look at the demographic changes and uh, you know, sort of do some other, uh, uh, make some other assumptions, inequality for the top 1% hasn't widened to the same extent. It's actually about 30%, the change is about 30% of what was originally measured in the studies. And at the same time, you know, when you look at the SCF data, uh, like Moritz did, uh, a lot of the times you're not measuring what people are actually getting at the bottom, right? I mean, Bruce Meyer and uh, other economists at Chicago have said about 40% of TANF uh, receipts and food stamp benefits are not actually uh, you know, s reported in survey data. So there are you know, basic fundamental issues about what really is going on with inequality and, and some other economists, and I've tried to look at consumption inequality and again find very different trends. So just, you know, what do you think about that? You know, should we be talking about sort of why income inequality is a problem before we even understand just what really is going on with the inequality data? Thanks. I think we have a couple of folks who can probably speak to that who wants to start. I mean, it's, I'll, I'll suggest one thing that's appropriate. So, so Fadi and I put out a paper last year at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis's quarterly review, which the title was something along the lines of a cautionary note for thinking about top income inequality, where we, we, we try to address a handful of the points that you mentioned, some of them, a subset of them, particularly related to different forms of income, um, particularly related to the focus on top income shares and the point that growth, the stagnation in the bottom is just as important for, as growth in the top for thinking about changes in, in, uh, in, uh, in top shares. Um, so, I, so I think I would speak for all of us, you guys can <coughs> disagree, that I mean, these are issues that I think we take very, very carefully. That there, I, I completely agree that sometimes the headline figures become overwhelming and, and form a life of their own. That was kind of the point of our, um, our quarterly review paper, that the top 1% share, in fact, post-2000, um, when you look at income inequality using that measure has shows very different trends depending on how you measure it what are the what's the what's the definition of income and uh, and uh, the source of the, the source of the data that you use 
Um, and I think the point you raise about uh, learning about what's going on at the bottom is, is equally important. Um, can, I want to make one, you asked how should we think through that. I think one thing to keep in mind is w in our discussions about inequality, we should um, be a little bit more careful about why it is that we're focused on inequality in a particular, particular discussion. I mean, when I present the paper that I, that I just mentioned, I start off by saying, and I, I have a bunch of examples of people will talk about some issue in inequality and then they'll just choose whatever measure they want that happens to show the trend in the time they want. But inequality is about a multivariate distribution which is complicated with a lot of different people and there can be all sorts of complicated things going on and we should remember why it is we care about it. There's a distinction between inequality and poverty um, which gets forgotten a lot of the time and, uh, the, and, and the, the issues about stagnation of, of incomes at the bottom, there are a lot of problems with measurement, particularly with re regards to price indices, um, that we need, to take in t t uh, we need to be aware of. I agree completely. Maybe I'll just add one thought to that. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's a bit sometimes kind of frustrating when uh, a lot of the debate on inequality is equated with the top 1%. And, um, and some, just like I, I'll repeat what uh, Greg said, but uh, distribution is a very complex object and different parts of it sometimes move in exactly opposite directions. Just to give you an example, if you look at the late 1990s, that's one of the periods when the top 1% share rose you know, the, mo the fastest in the last 40 years. But that's also the period when the gap between the bottom end, the 10th percentile, and the median contracted the fastest. So if you just look at top 1%, we'll say inequality rose during that period, but we'll be missing the fact that actually wages were growing very fast at the bottom. And uh, just again, you know, uh, echoing what, what uh, Greg said, the stagnation of you know, median wages for males especially, that's another form of inequality because they kept separating from the top of the distribution. And, um, and there's a lot of people in the middle, right? You know, as opposed to the top 1%. Um, so I think that, you know, should get a lot more attention in my view, um, rather than equating, you know, as it's done in, in a lot of the, you know, uh, public discussions. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Clarida, question? Uh, yes. Should I wait for the microphone or just speak loud? I think you should. Here it comes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the recording is better. Well, first of all, uh, this was an excellent panel, all four uh, presentations, and so my commendation to Abigail uh, for organizing a super first session sets a high standard. Um, a comment or a question both for Fatih and, and Greg, Isabel, I can follow up at the, at the board on your excellent uh, paper, so I won't take time uh, here. Um, and I've really admired your work over the years, Fatih. Um, just a actually pretty wonkish question on your paper. You mentioned the, the database, which is Social Security. Is there a top coding issue with Social Security? Um, and if so, how did you, you deal uh, with that? And then my, uh, my question for Greg is on a different topic. Uh, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, in most Social Security data sets around the world, uh, there is a top code, uh, except the US Social Security administrations, and after 1978, there is no... Because of the, Medi the Medicare, um, um, change in the Medicare tax. Yes, so in 1978, basically, they moved on to a different system, and we do some work, you know, both with Greg and with others on going back to the 1950s, that data is top-coded and there's imputation. But the current one actually is not. It's just whatever is in the W2 box one, it is, that's what's reported. Um, Around, you know, in different European countries, in many, in many of them, it's not through Social Security, so you can actually get, you know, non-top coded. Uh, whereas in others, it, it has the top code. And then, Greg, uh, for you, I, I, um, I've been myself uh, thinking for several years about this issue of the cyclicality of, 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 of labor share, because at least in my vintage, I'd not seen a lot of macro work, so I'm really delighted that, that folks are, are thinking about it now. And one of the things in the U.S. data that's interesting, and it was actually in your chart, mm. is that the pickup in labor's share certainly tends to peak in recessions, but it begins to rise several years before. So I would call it sort of at least, you know, quasi-stylized fact. So it's not just a recession mm. 
phenomenon. And indeed, if you talk to folks in equity markets, uh, mm -hmm. which I don't do now, but I used to, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they actually, the equity folk talk about this, the late it's cycle already. profit squeeze, labor share goes up, profit share goes, goes down. So I guess the, the, the question for you is in your monetary model, what implications did that or did that not have for, for price inflation? Because at least in the last two or three U.S. rate hike cycles, mm. uh, you did see this late cycle increase in labor share, but it didn't really translate into price inflation because the profits took the hit. So in your model, do you have any predictions about, about that? Because that's obviously um, relevant. So let me see if I understand. So, the, so my understanding of the data is that um, the labor share peaks and the profit share bottoms in a recession, at the peak of the recession. Right. It's a, depending which one you look at, it's a leading indicator of a recession. So there's a lot of information, information, information that trend, and then it comes back down slowly. So it seems to, it seems to peak around that. In terms of prices and in inflation, um, I, don't think, I don't think this, I mean, maybe we can talk afterwards. Within my model, I think they kind of, it's kind of orthogonal because all that inflation, inflation is determined by a monetary policy rule. Um, you can get it to be as aggressive as you want depending on, on, on how you set up the rule. This is really about uh, how the changes in, in, it's a real variable, it's a change in, in real markups um, respond to, uh, uh, re how the changes in fact the input demands respond to the change in that real variable. And depending on monetary policy, you can get different relationships between that. Oh, so. Yeah, exactly, so we can follow yeah, up. But again, up uh, thanks for working yeah. on, this, uh, on this topic. It's a really important one, thank you. I just had uh, just just a comment on one one paper that I was looking at recently. It's an, an interesting paper that's um, by Smith, Yaga, and uh, Zwick and Zida, capitalists in the 21st century. So they they have some information on some of these people at the top of the income and the wealth distribution. And um, a lot of those people, as, as you probably know, they're people who are kind of own and run their own business, or you know, uh, perhaps as a partnership. So there's a bunch of doctors and lawyers and entrepreneurs, small-scale entrepreneurs running little businesses, and what they find is that, um, is that you know, when the owner of this business dies, the profits of the business collapse and the value of the business collapses too. So if you think about what these businesses are, whether the wealth of the business, the value of the business, is it really capital or is it really human capital? And the income that's flowing to these entrepreneurs, is it really sort of capital income or is it really returns to their own human capital, it's a, it's a little bit uh, ambiguous. So I think you know, it's a little bit re related to some of the different discussions, but when you think about these guys at the top, are they just, they're not guys owning you know, huge amounts of the S&P 500 and collecting lots of rents. A, a lot of them are, are running their own businesses and um, yeah, it seems like the, you could think of it as returns to human capital perhaps more than uh, physical capital. Yes. <laughs> no, it's a fantastic paper, that. I mean, I, I, I completely agree. So I have a question for Greg and Isabel, kind of thinking about the, the models you guys put forward. Um, so <clears throat> kind of what I absorbed out of those, it seems like the main mechanism that in, in these models that are, are you know, whether it's New Keynesian or RBC, that's linking inequality to either business cycles or monetary policy, however you want to think about it, is doing so through markups. And when I think about markups, I think about competition. And I know there's some empirical work out there where people have talked about kind of the empirical link and changes in competition and, and co industry concentration all time, over time and, and inequality. Um, so there's some evidence of it. But I'm also kind of wondering if, if you know, if, if that really is the main mechanism that's working here to, to deliver that link between policy and inequality, are we baking too much into the cake in the sense of, you know, kind of automatically attributing some role for, for competition here? And, you know, is, is that is that going to kind of somehow stifle how we think about other things? So, for example, like the, the housing, you know, the effect of the role of housing that, that Maritz had put up. So I was wondering what your guys' thoughts on that were. Do you want to start? I mean, I agree with you that it's kind of a black box at this point. And um, I think this has a, you know, um, perhaps a downside of, of my paper, right? That it just puts in this black box this, all this change in, in, in the markups and where exactly where is this coming from and how do we think about relation with competition? So 
I think that the literature is um, doing, you know, the latest papers on trying to compute um, marginal costs and markups are um, really moving us forward in understanding those trends and really thinking that there is actually some increase in market power, but uh, the underlying trends of that, what is exactly behind that, trade, competition, or you know, many other things that you may think about, I think we, are still, we still need to learn more about that. So for now, it's, in my model, it's like a black box, but more, more light from the data is really necessary here to understand a bit more, yeah. I'll add maybe a couple of things to that. So, um, so the fo my focus on markups was because it's my understanding is that basically the best that the profession can offer at the moment in terms of um, models of how stuff from the demand side of the economy propagates operates through markups. Okay? But that being said, um, the, some of the issues that you suggested are more to do with consumption and wealth inequality. But when it comes to income inequality, I think the, the, the structure that I put down um, has the potential to talk to a lot of other changes. So these parameters that I was describing, which I talked about how it works through markups, but you can also think about it, think about it as, as, as we change the production structure of the economy to one in which more of um, costs come from things that show up as uh, overhead type costs versus costs of goods sold. And we know that the distinction, if you know, follow the literature of markups, the distinction between things that show up in SG&A and costs of goods sold, is really important for thinking about competition. This gives you the same way to think about how does that translate into labor market inequality. So I'm sh in, in general, of course, we could write down aggregate production functions and just posit that there's different people and they enter the aggregate production function in different ways and then there are non-neutral shocks. So the classic example of that is Crusoe, Ojeño, and Rios, Rural, and Violante. Um, but since then, we haven't really been able to move further than that than th into thinking about how things would propagate through things like monetary policy or the demand side of the economy. And that leads you to a question that leads you directly to think start thinking about markups. I think we'll take we'll take one more question. <laughs> Thank you, Fabrizio. Just to follow up on, on this question, similar to for Greg, I, I really like your last picture, right, in which you say there's a shock monetary policy and expansion of monetary policy, and that's what we deal every six weeks. You know, so should we lower the interest rate? And the usual channel, oh, we lower interest rate, the economy's going to be a little bit better, everybody's better off. And you say, eh, wait a second. And you had this picture say there's a distribution, and some people are better off, but some people actually are worse off. Um, and I mean, I, I really like the picture. I, I don't fully, I didn't fully understand. So I'll say, could you, could you explain us why, yeah. when you lower the expansion monetary policy, why some people fall? What's what's the mechanism? In some occupation thing, but I wasn't sure if you could spend two words on that. That'd be sure. I don't want to take up too much of the the space. But okay, first, we should be clear that. The idea that different people can gain and different people can lose from monetary policy is already there in the literature, but it shows up more that people are exposed to different types of assets and yeah. asset price moves. Okay, so that's through the wealth and the consumption distribution. Okay, this is something trying to go a little bit deeper than say there's another channel. Maybe that this the key force, the one that uh, I, I wrote down what Neil's response because I get asked that question and I thought it was a fantastic response. That um, at the end of the day, how people are affected by monetary policy is how are they affected through the labor market. Okay, so what goes on in, in my model is that some people's occupations are going to be positively exposed to a markup, changing markups, and other people to a negatively exposed to a change of markups. Why might that be? Think about how, um, why labor demand goes up in the typical kind of New Keynesian way of thinking about a monetary shock. Prices go up, costs don't change, or you can think about it the other way around, costs go down and prices don't change. So, so mark, as they say it's an expansionary shock, so markups fall. If markups fall, that means we're going to be moving down the demand curve. We're going to expand production. In order to meet the additional, mm -hmm. the additional production, we have to hire more workers in order to make those goods. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You go out and hire those workers who are involved in making the goods. But at the same time, your markup has fallen. Because your markup has fallen, you're making low, lower, lower profits. Not just markups, but profits. This is the dirty secret of the New Keynesian model. It's not just markups, it's profits. On each of those, in each of those production processes. So what you might want to do is scale back your activities on expansion, on uh, maybe uh, not re release the next product of the, uh, you know, the next range of your iPhone, the new color, the new demographic market. So that means you might hire fewer graphic designers, fewer managers, fewer whoever the people are who deck out the the new store. There are some there are some types of occupations who are going to move in the opposite direction. 
Now, everyone might gain, but we might just shift the distribution around them. But that's the point I want to dri drive, that there's, sh there's shifts going on in types of occupations. This has been a really great conversation. Um, and I thank all of you for all your work and your presentations. So we will now have a break, uh, maybe thank our panelists one more time, and we'll reconvene at 4.